I tell everybody we're kind of half Disneyland and half drivers that around this place. Could be a Jeep down there. Don't want to hit him. Stuck. He's stuck, right? Right here? Yeah. Uh, what are we in? A Prius? We got clearance. We're an off-road vehicle. So Ford said, all right, let's not only teach them about their vehicles, but let's teach them how to prepare themselves to go off-road. Oh, my goodness. It's great. And the oh, my gosh. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to Auto Journey. Today we are out in Nevada in the beautiful wilderness at an experience called Bronco Off Rodeo. Now what Bronco Off Rodeo is, is an experience that Ford puts on to show you how to take your Bronco off road and we're gonna take you with us. In just a few minutes, we're gonna head on up the hill here to the pavilion, do some introductions and Bronco talk. Uh, we've already gotten everything out of the way that we need to uh, at the deck at Merch Shop, all the boring paperwork and stuff. The merch shop will be open for you guys at lunchtime and dinner time. Come through and see me. We'll get you set up with all your Bronco swag needs. Uh, here on the deck, if you haven't seen it already, got a couple of water coolers, box water, snacks, coffee, tea, hot cocoa, uh, some advertisements from some of our sponsors. Please feel free to help yourself to any of that stuff throughout the day. Uh, I'll be replenishing that all throughout the day. When you guys come back uh, for restroom breaks, that sort of thing here to base camp, feel free to come on up here on the deck, refill your water bottles, refill your coffee cups, whatever you'd like to do. Um, in case you missed it, the yellow trailer down here to my right uh, that has restrooms splattered across the side of it, uh, lo and behold, that's the restroom trailer. Uh, we like to send out a little shout out for, to Ford for <coughs> ponying up a couple extra bucks for us for the nice clean restroom trailers for you guys because uh, we still use the nasty old Boy Scout camp restrooms for the most part Very usually nice around here. Uh, so that's pretty styling, yeah, right? Uh, just a couple minutes, we're going to head on up the hill here to the pavilion. At the pavilion, we're going to do introductions with the trail guides, get to know you guys a little bit, do some Bronco talk. We'll spend probably 45 minutes or so up there. Then when we're done up there, we're going to come down the hill here behind the pool house to the ORX course, the off-road experience course. We're going to walk around there for an hour, hour and a half this morning, talk Bronco stuff. Then we're going to head over to our Broncos, head out for a trail ride this morning about an hour, hour and a half, come back to the pavilion about noon for lunch, about 12.45, hop back into our Broncos, go out for another four hours or so of trail riding this afternoon, come back to dinner at the pavilion about five o'clock, and that's our day. I tell everybody we're kind of half Disneyland and half drivers that around this place. Uh, we are going to, our trail guides, they know everything that there is to know about these machines. They know, uh, you know, know them inside out, backwards and forwards, left to right, upside down, the whole shebang, and they want to download all that information to you guys. So if you have a Bronco question in your head, today is the day to ask. Um, they should be able to answer just about any question that you guys have right off the top of their head. Uh, if for any reason they don't have an answer for you for any of your questions, they will do their best uh, to get you an answer by the end of the day. Um, they're going to teach you what all the buttons do, what all the dials do, what all the lights mean, what all the crazy little gizmos and gadgets and doohickeys in your Bronco do, how to use them, when to use them, probably more importantly than any of that is when not to use a lot of them. So uh, ask your questions, uh, make them actually think for once, make them earn their paycheck for the day. Uh, I can tell you, however, though, with all of that being said, there is unfortunately one question that hands down without a doubt 110% uh, we do not have an answer for you. Uh, and unfortunately, that is when am I going to see my Bronco in my driveway? So, all right, no help there. Unfortunately, anybody not have their Bronco yet? All right, looks like we're batting a thousand right out the gate. Then we're doing good. So that's cool. Good, good, good. Uh, feel free to take all the pictures and video and all that jazz that you guys would like to throughout the day. You'll probably see us taking some pictures and video of you guys as well. Uh, we send that back to our headquarters uh, so we can show them what an amazing time you guys are having. They already hear about it all the time, but we like to reinforce it with pictures. Sometimes they throw those up on our social media pages for us, that sort of thing. Uh, when you all have the opportunity to do so, whether it be today or tomorrow or next week, when you have a chance, please post your pictures and videos up on y'all's websites or your, your, your own social media pages. Uh, put them up on your, I don't know, your Facebooks and your TikToks and your Snapchats and your Instagrams and your MySpace pages, I don't know, whatever MySpace. else you got out there. Hit them with the hashtag Bronco Off Rodeo for us. Uh, tell everybody what an amazing time you had here today. Uh, tell them how awesome Mean Gene is. If you want to be nice and throw in a good word about your trail guides, they're pretty okay for the most part too. So we'll allow that. I've been with uh, Bronco Off Rodeo for two years now. I opened up an awesome Texas location and uh, been here. So. Pretty cool thing, Bronco's pretty awesome. And uh, excited that you guys are all here today to get to learn more about your Bronco. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Diego Salinas, born and raised in San Diego, California. So for the Southern Californians in this group, I'm gonna be making fun of us a lot today. Uh, been off-roading a lot of you. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> uh, 
I've been off-roading my entire life, but being from Southern California, my background is higher speed, loose terrain style driving. Uh, don't get that into your head because we're going to do absolutely none of that today. <laughs> it is all slow, technical rock crawling. Uh, I have two Broncos on order. So for those of you that have your Broncos, congratulations. Must be nice. Uh, for those of you that are waiting, me too. I have two. They are both four-door. One's a base, one's a big bend. Sasquatch package off to my hard top. My name is Ron. I am born and raised in Sarasota, Florida. Transplanted to Las Vegas in 2004. Spent 20 years in the motorsports industry. Um, one of my bosses was AJ Foyt, uh, who was also a very world-renowned Ford driver with Dan Gurney, who won the original Ford uh, Le Mans race. Um, so it was a pleasure to be able to work for him. I do have a Bronco, and that is one of the reasons that I'm here. Uh, because we needed it to get up to our house in Utah because of the snow and sleet and mud and whatever else. Uh, and it has performed remarkably. Uh, so we were very impressed with that and uh, thus got the opportunity to come out here. So we've got a lot of diverse people here. Uh, we want you to be very interactive with us. We're gonna be very interactive with you. Um, so we're gonna start here this is our map wall, and when we're done, we're gonna have you all come up and put a pin uh, on where you live. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, living wild with Bronco. Uh, again, everybody, I see most everybody has phones over on uh, our accessory wall and various points around the property. You will see QR codes, feel free to hit those. But, um, Ford has developed an ambassador group. Uh, these ambassadors are like us. They have Broncos, and they do things from snowboarding, water, some motorsports, but mountain biking, rock climbing, uh, ice climbing, trails, adventures. So they are out using their Bronco and showing how they use it, what they do, and talking about taking care of the environment. These are all really, close to the environment type people. So they're focused on you know, taking care, taking out what you take in, making sure when they leave everything is uh, fine. There's some really good people, really interesting uh, people to follow if you're into following on social media. So hit those QR codes when you're done and um, you know, take a look at uh, some of our ambassadors. They may be in communities that you live in or close to. So it's always fun to uh, follow them. Ford has developed, uh, does anyone know about the Bronco Wild Fund? Have they heard about the Bronco Wild Fund? All right, so this is a $5 million endowment to help sustainability and to help and work with people that are out there doing good on our trails, in, you know, to be able to maintain and keep our trails. It's very important. Johnny, and I'm gonna let him speak to it a little bit, <laughs> because he has a really personal uh, effect uh, on what, you know, something that's happened to him, because we, most of us can go out and do whatever we want, uh, but we like to do it sometimes in our Bronco. We don't want to do it with our legs. Um, so Ford has developed this. They have worked with the National Forest Foundation, and as you can see on here, some of the national forests throughout the country. Out on the West Coast, we have a lot of public lands. You don't have those east, and you guys probably have less up north unless you go way up, uh, especially in you know, your area. So these public lands are very important to us, and we don't want to ruin them. Um, so they've developed these funds so that they can replant trees, um, they can take care. We work with Outward Bound, which is youth, getting youth out into the wild, out in, you know, letting them understand what they can do and taking care of the environment because they're gonna be around longer than we are. You know, guys like the little guy here, Cody, I mean, it's gonna be important to him someday when we're all gone and, you know, he's up here talking about, hey, I had a Bronco, my dad had a Bronco, you know, when we went out, we took care of things. That's very important. America State Parks. Now, we have a lot of state parks and national parks on the west coast, you have more on the central and east because obviously the land. 
So especially in Florida, I know we've got a couple of Florida folks, and you know, being from Florida, there weren't a lot. Uh, Disney took over, you know, your area, and you know, it's just we, you've got the beach, and then you've got this spit of land, and if you don't go in the interior where the orange trees are and the big signs that say no trespassing, there aren't a lot of places to go. So, you know, working with the state parks um, and making sure that those stay maintained and stay developed is very important. Sons of Smokey, has anyone heard of Sons of Smokey? The Sons of Smokey was a group of Oregon hippie guys that, and girls, but mostly guys, that decided, hey, we really like the environment we're living in, but there's a lot of trash and we need to go out and do something about this trash. So they started an event called? Gambler 500. Gambler 500. The Gambler 500 was $500 vehicle, get as much trash as you can. So these guys developed this, they went out into the public lands, and if you've ever been out in the West Coast, you will see things like refrigerators, cars, beds, baggies of trash. I mean, it's, it's deplorable. So these guys went out and then they developed this race to go out and it's a cheap $500 car, strap all the trash on it that you can, the guy comes back with the most weight, wins. And so they've been doing this now for almost a decade and probably close to 5 million pounds of trash. Ford has worked with them and is taking care of recycling or disposing of that trash. So that's very important. Last but not least, and it is not on here, is Tread Lightly. And you're gonna hear us speak about Tread Lightly a lot today. Um, if you don't know Tread Lightly, look it up, become a member if you want, but just, you know, it, it is what it is. So, you know, you travel responsibly. You respect the rights of others. You work and educate. You adapt and you don't leave things behind. So that being said, I would like Johnny just to talk just briefly about your situation with COVID and uh, why the Bronco and these funds are so important. Yeah. Um, so I guess the, the whole essence of the Wild Fund is their goal is just to connect people to the outdoors responsibly, right? We all are here because we probably want to experience the outdoors in another way with our Bronco. I'm assuming most of you do enjoy going outside because we know nature has an ability to communicate to us on a deeper level, we can have some healing power and different things that can happen out there. And so, to me, seeing that the Ford brands recognize that in the outdoor world, there's been some conflicts between different user groups, between the motorized access groups and those people who enjoy the outdoors without an engine, dust them out. Um, there's a little bit of headbutting between those groups. And so what Ford's trying to do is just help Kind of build bridges because everyone going outdoors we're going out there basically for the same reason we want to experience wild things and so whether we do that motorized access or on foot or on bike or however we get out there uh, we all have a right to go out there um to me the, the thing i get passionate about and why we're on the second end of this conversation is um uh if, if you look at kind of the basis of the anti-off-road community they're saying that if i'm not healthy enough to strap on a backpack and climb up a mountain or get on a bicycle and go pedal for miles, I don't belong outside. And that's wrong. Uh, we know that that power of nature can connect and heal the people. And so there's many people who can't physically go out there. There's people who are born with physical and mental disabilities. There's people, um, you know, with age comes, you know, some limitations. I can still crawl in a vehicle and go and experience wild things. Um, there's our veterans that come back with their challenges. And so, to me, it's pretty cool to be a part of this brand who cares about educating their owners, who cares about protecting the land and keeping that land open. Um, there's many examples all over the place every single year of different trails and different wild places getting shut down to motorized access. There's places we absolutely have to protect for sure, um, but also we still need to maintain open access for many people. So, Ron mentioned uh, I had a bad experience. So COVID about killed me, um, six weeks in the hospital, two weeks on a ventilator and then seven months of therapy before I was able to get back to work. Uh, I still have about, uh, I still have a, a very, like, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, I have half of my lung capacity that I used to have. Um, I can't go biking, I raced mountain bikes in high school. 
I coach a snowboard team. I met my wife. I'm a lift line. She's a ski instructor. I can't go do these things I used to be able to do because my lungs don't process oxygen the way they used to. And so to me, maintaining and protecting motorized access is tremendously important. And before this incident, but it's been almost two years now, um, you know, happened to me, you know, I was, I was a proponent for motorized access. And we took out youth groups. We took out, um, a couple of years ago, took out a, a school that was specifically for uh, disabled youth. Loaded them all up. I let one kid drive my Jeep that day, and he drove my Jeep all day long up through the mountains in Utah. Um, the next year, we took out a senior center. So if these folks were physically and healthy enough to, to leave the, the building for a while, we loaded them up, took them up on this cliff that overlooked their town, did a big barbecue, the energy and, and happiness and things that they saw. And that was just really, really cool. And, and we've done tons and tons of work with veterans. And so uh, to me, I get passionate about it. It's important. Um, and I, I'm glad we have this platform here. I'm glad that Ford cares about their Bronco owners. And they want their Bronco owners to be educated um, on how their vehicle works, as well as ways that they can help protect and maintain the public lands that we have. Uh, the government's not the most efficient manager of public lands, and if a place gets abused or run down or too many complaints, their solution is cloture. And uh, that's not really cool. So, anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox, but that's pretty much why. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to take a minute. I'm going to have everyone come up, grab a pin, and then once you pin your location on the map wall, I'm going to have you direct your attention to our Bronco in the middle. So, you came here to learn about your Bronco. Whether you have all the off-road experience in the world or the dirt road on your way up here this morning was accidental off-road, that's perfectly fine. We all got to start from somewhere and build our way up. We have to talk about the first few things like spatial awareness. Now, you have spatial awareness when you drove up the hill this morning. You have to worry about the vehicles next to you so you don't run into them. You have to worry about the curbs because they'll come up and get you. So, when we have to off-road, we have to change that mindset. Instead of the vehicle next to me, let me worry about those obstacles next to me. Instead of the curb, you worry about the cliff, things like that. So when you have, when you're off-roading, English is hard for me, sorry. When you're off-roading, you have three major angles you have to worry about. There's one in the front, one in the middle, and one in the back, all going hand in hand with spatial awareness. Anyone know what the one in the front is called? The angle in the front? Approach. Approach. Angle. approach. All right. So I heard somebody say it over here. Who said it over here? All right. Approach. So we're going back to kindergarten, everybody. You do something right, or you answer a question. I give you a sticker. I'm really good at handing these out. They call me Sticker Oprah on this property. Ron is really good at taking them back if you mess up, so be careful. So, Jason, in order to keep this sticker, that approach angle, we have to measure from two points. What two points do we measure from? Okay, so. <laughs> so, how we measure that approach angle? It is the contact patch and the front tire. So, where the tire is making contact with the ground. Good job treading lightly. You can keep that. So it's the contact patch of that front tire. So where the tire is making contact with the ground. So the furthest lowest hanging point of the front of your vehicle. So in this case, it would be our front bumper. So if I took a piece of plywood, tucked it into those two points, that straight line right there is my approach angle. But why do I have to worry about that? Why do I care about that? Exactly. If I don't have that approach angle clearance, as I curl all up to that obstacle, I'm going to go straight into it with not my tire, but my lovely front bumper or my fender flares, or my headlight. Now, if I could crawl up to an obstacle, what's gonna cave in first, a bumper or a bolt? Yeah. All right, I'm not getting stickers for that one, which is not. <laughs> so now if we go to the middle, what's the one in the middle called? No, not quite. Any ideas, anything, anything? Center. So, dark <laughs> so it is called your ramp breakover angle, or just your breakover. Now, how we measure that, Contact point of, point of that front tire. I'm gonna stutter a lot today. I just figured, figured that. Out. Contact patch of the front tire. Straight line across to the contact patch of that rear tire. Take the center of that wheelbase, the lowest hanging point of the center of that wheelbase. So it just makes a triangle on your vehicle. Now why do I have to worry about that? That's where we're gonna get hung up. Yeah, that's where we're gonna get hung up. So you can get up and you can get high centered like that. Now how high centering works is you crest over an obstacle with your front tire. You have no issue. But as you come off that obstacle with your front tires you don't have that ramp breakover clearance. So now that obstacle is getting stuck in the middle of your vehicle. So we call that high centered stuck on these trails. We don't like to say stuck, so we say momentally challenged. <laughs> uh, we also call it getting turtled. If you've ever seen a turtle get stuck and they flail their arms off to the side, that's kind of us. So now if we go to the back, we have the approach, breakover, and the departure. 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 All right, you know how this works. How do I measure that departure angle? Yeah, now you change the front. 
Yeah, exactly. That is the perfect answer. Take the same concept as the front, stick it to the back, contact patch of the rear point or the rear tire to the lowest hanging point of the rear of your vehicle. But the departure angle, that's where most damage happens. Why do we think that is? Can't see it. Exactly. When I'm driving in the driver's seat, and I'm assuming everybody else does this, we're all driving shoulders forward. I'm looking down the trail, I'm seeing what's coming up, and I'm looking at what's right next to me. So if I'm rock crawling, I go over an obstacle with my approach angle, I have clearance, I'm good, sweet. I make it back to the breakover, I have clearance, sweet. I don't know if any of you know anything about baseball or softball. I'm two for two right now, I'm killing. So naturally, since I'm two for two, I'm going to assume that that one's gonna be perfectly fine. That's where my mistake happens. Because now I'm gonna get off the brake, I'm gonna pick up the speed off an obstacle, I'm gonna fall off, and I'm gonna land. Everyone saw how my knees kind of bent? So that's your suspension compressing when you fall off that obstacle. When that happens, you're losing out on clearance, you're closer to the ground, and then you can be like that person on YouTube. You can find this video, by the way, where they landed on their spare tire in a Bronco and it bashed in and caved in the back of their vehicle. Yeah, watch that video tonight and learn from that. So when you're driving, you wanna make sure that you're holding yourself accountable for all three angles, especially that one in the back. Easiest way to remember is when I'm in the driver's seat, I got $30,000 in front of me, I got $30,000 behind me. That's gonna hold me accountable pretty well. Or look at your monthly payment, that'll help out as well. Now we go back to the front. We got two engine options, what are they? 2.3.7. Yeah, 2.3.4 cylinder, 2.7.6 cylinder. It's where the power gets built. Now from there, where does the power go? Transmission. Boom, that's the answer I'm looking for. So transmission, we have two transmission options. Pretty simple, 10 speed automatic, seven speed manual transmission. Now today, we have a surprisingly odd amount of manual transmission drivers today, so I guess I have to talk about it. <laughs> so for that manual transmission, so we're all on the same page, it's got six regular gears, one crawler gear. That crawler gear is very similar. If you've ever driven an old school four-wheel drive with that granny gear, similar concept. Now that crawler gear, I think that ratio, if you're a super nerd and you want to look into it, is a 94.5 to 1, which is ridiculous. You take it up to any type of climb, if you have clearance and grip, it'll climb you up anything. It's awesome. Beautiful, beautiful feature. Now for the 10-speed automatic, because that's what we have on these trails, that's what everyone's gonna be driving. We have no manual transmissions out here because we didn't want to turn into driver's ed. So for that 10-speed <laughs> automatic transmission, if I'm driving typical Californian speeds, 95 miles an hour down the highway. Now in those 10 gears, what gear am I in out of all those 10? Yeah, I'm in 10th, right? Now if I come to a stop, what gear am I in? First, someone said zero the other day. A little bit of a red flag. So, yeah, that's how the gears work. The speeds, the ciphers, which gear you're in. Now, from that transmission, where does the power go after that? Where does that power transfer to? Transfer case. Somebody might have said it. Did you say it? Uh, transfer case. Transfer case, yes, transfer case. How does the transfer case work, Shane? Yeah. Basically, it'll go to your front shaft or your back shaft. And yeah. So exactly as the name says, it transfers that power to the front and rear of our vehicle, giving us our four-wheel drive. And it is a two-speed transfer case. What does two-speed mean? Yes. Low and high. Yeah, low and high, perfect. So high range. High range is the natural operating range of your vehicle. That's what you were in when you drove up this morning. Let you get up to those higher speeds. Pretty normal, nothing too special about it. But four-wheel drive, low range, what does that do for us? Crawl. Yeah, crawling, perfect. So, four-wheel drive, low range. Gives us power to the front and rear tires. Keeps us in the lower gearing, but more torque in that lower gearing. So it's four climbing over obstacles. <coughs> so if we look at that boulder pile over there, that, those big ones. If I was in four-wheel drive, high range, what would I need to get over those boulders? A ramp. Speed. <laughs> a ramp would be great. I would need speed, a seatbelt, probably a chiropractor after. That's not gonna be very nice. So what I wanna use instead is I wanna use four low. What I can do is crawl up to that obstacle, use that added torque to slowly climb over it in a much safer manner. So now myself and my vehicle, a lot more comfortable, a lot more safe. So that's why four low is important. Lower speeds, crawling over obstacles, rock crawling, a lot of what we're gonna do today. Four wheel drive, high range, picking up the speed, having some fun. Now from the transfer case through a drive shaft to a... Drive on you're not wrong, but I'm looking for a specific answer. We call it the pumpkin? Differential. Differential, there you go. So differentials, what they do, they take that power, send it to the tires. Now on road, there's an advantage to it, why we have it, is it lets us turn at different rates of speed. So if I had to make a left turn right here, this is my inside tire, this is my outside tire. 
as I make that turn, the one on the outside has to get more rotations because it's covering more ground. So that one on the inside is going to get a lot less. So on road lets us turn. Now if you really want to know how differentials work, I will give you one piece of homework tonight. Go watch the movie My Cousin Vinny. They explain it flawlessly. <laughs> now if you don't remember that movie, when she's on the stand, she says if you've ever slammed on the gas and when you're stuck in mud in Alabama and you get one wheel just spinning deep into the ground and the other that you want traction is getting nothing. That is because differentials are lazy and they send power to the wheel with least resistance. So for a good example, what was your name again, boss? Cody. Cody, all right, Cody, you're not gonna do this, it's just an example, but you see how the vehicle is leaning towards me right now? Yeah. So now we know that all the weight is transferred, or most of the weight, I should say, is transferred to this side. So this tire and this suspension component is compressed a little bit more, more weight is on this. Knowing that, if we go to that other side, that tire is drooping a little bit more, there's not as much weight on it. So with your two bare hands and your big muscles, which one would you like to rotate with your bare hand? That one. How come? Uh, because all the weight is on this, this one, right? tire and there's not yeah. as much. Perfect. So that's going to be easier for you, right? Yeah. Spot on. That's a perfect answer. I hope everyone thought the same way. <laughs> if you chose the hard one with all the weight on it, you got some problems. <laughs> but yeah, so if that wheel was about one to two feet in the air, just a little bit, and we're losing traction. Differentials like to send power to the wheel with least resistance. So it would send all that power there, and we'd get nothing here. So we'd be momentally challenged. So what could I use in a situation like that? Locker. Yeah, locker. Yeah, so you could use a differential locker. What that does, takes the gears, <coughs> binds them together, and even if that tire's a foot to three feet in the air, it doesn't really matter, whichever one's losing traction, it's gonna evenly distribute that power to both left and right. So it evenly distributes that power, so they get equal amount of power, equal amount of rotations when that differential is locked. Does that make sense with everybody? So instead of one spinning, now we got both equal. Now, take that concept, put it to the front, front lock. Now, if you really want to get technical, technical, they're called electronically actuated differential front locking mechanisms. Am I going to say that all day? Is Ron going to say that all day? Absolutely not. We're going to say front lockers and rear lockers. But if I had to locate a locker and turn it on, where would I find that button? All right. Say it again. Hero buttons. Do you know why they're called hero buttons? Because Ford is cheesy as heck. <laughs> so the reason they're called hero buttons is because they could be your hero out on the trail. Like I said, cheesy, but down to say I'm brand new. So right up on the top center of the dash, right above your media screen, those are your hero button panels, or switches, whichever one you'd like to say. Now depending on the trim of your vehicle, you might have all six, you might only have two. Everyone is going to learn about what every single one of those buttons does, even if you don't have it. So we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit later. We we'll go down to your media screen. If you have the big media screen in the front camera, use that to your advantage today. There's only two Broncos out of our 32 that have them. Very great to have, uh, great necessity for rock crawling. Go down to the gear shifter. Behind the gear shifter, we have a GOAT mode down. What does GOAT stand for? If you say Tom Brady, I'm gonna send you home. Go over any terrain. All right, so you said goes over any terrain. You are correct. But it also used to be goes over all terrain. It actually switched. So it went from goes over all terrain when Go was originally released. It was the nickname for the Bronco. Then they brought the Broncos back and said, all right, well, we're gonna go with Goating. And then lawyers got involved because don't they always? And they said, well, you technically can't go over all terrain because lava is a terrain and you can't drive over lava. So you can't go over all terrain. So Bronco and Ford had to change it to goes over any type of terrain. Why is that better and how is that better? I have no idea, but that's what I'm told to tell you. <laughs> so that's what GOAT stands for. Now, if I were to look at that GOAT mode dial, on the very top, I see my ranges. So I see too high. So that is just power to the back tires, high range of your vehicle, everyday drive. Now, if I wanted to go a little bit faster on loose terrain, just out driving like this, all right, I should put it into that four high. Power to the front and rear tires in that high range. We talked about rock crawling over those big boulders. All right, four wheel drive low ranges on that left side. And then we have 4A. What is 4A? 4 auto. What does that do for me, though? It distributes power to the tire that needs it most. So if you front tire slip, it moves power to the front tire. Nice. Perfect. So it's kind of like an all-wheel drive system. So it'll start you off in 2 high or 4 high, depending on the type of terrain you're on. So if you go into slippery mode or sport mode, it'll put you in a 4A. What it does is it'll start you off in 2 high. As the vehicle detects that it's losing traction, it will apply power to the front tires momentarily putting you into four high. So if you ever drive on very slippery roads like Ron when he's trying to get to his house in Utah, that's a good idea being in that slippery. 
Now, if I were to turn that dial, what would happen? If I were to just grab it and go, wham, what happens? It changes drive mode. Yeah, we have drive modes. We have terrain management modes. Now, we'll talk about those a little bit later. The only reason I bring them up here is because I don't want you to turn that dial until we tell you after lunch. Because if you start turning that dial and put yourself in a sport mode when I need you rock crawling, it's going to be a little weird. So please refrain from spinning that dial. We'll talk about it later. We'll talk about all what it does. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much for it up here. What we're going to do now is please grab all of your belongings because we won't be back up here till lunchtime, about 12 o'clock. Point where we're going to talk to you about how we want you to drive our vehicles, how we want you to sit in them, steer, park. Uh, we're going to talk about some obstacles up there. We're going to talk about some techniques and technology. If you do not have some of the technologies we talked about today, we will give you a replacement and we'll teach you the technique of it as well. Same thing goes for the manual transmission drivers. We have things for you too. So, for starters, seating position. Now being from Southern California, and thankfully Ron already set it up for me, Ooh, baby. I like to be all the way back in my seat, <laughs> one hand on the wheel, barely looking over the wheel. Now there's an issue with that. What's no, the issue? On, we do have some people from Florida. So what they're used to is they're used to Granny looking through this part of the steering wheel, okay? And she's sitting in the proper position. She's just down here. <laughs> So what do we need to change with those seating positions? Yeah, you need to go up higher, right? For better visibility. We need a see over. So if you have the electric switches in your own personal Broncos, we're not bougie like that on this property. We don't have that. We have all the manual switches. So under the seat, there's a pull to slide forward or back. There's a little dial right here for lumbar support. If you are vertically challenged, there's a pump handle that will get you extremely high up. Here. And then the one in the far back is going to adjust that back. Now what we want is a command seating position. Now what that is, is you're just up higher, more upright, closer to the steering wheel and the pedals. I just want you to be close enough to the steering wheel where you have full range of motion without having to lock your arms, but not too close, of course, where you're doing little T-Rex arms all day when you're trying to drive. Uh, we want you closer to the pedals. We are gonna be in four low the majority of the day, and that four low gives you added torque. So you have to apply more brake pressure to stop the vehicle than you normally would in too high on the road. But so making sure we get closer. Now I don't want you so upright to where your belly button and your belt buckle are communicating with each other because that's not very comfortable. So try to find that happy in between. So Jason, thank you for volunteering. How about you? <laughs> so we like to volunteer people. Now sometimes we'll ask for volunteers, but most of the time it's volunteer. All right, so Jason, what you're gonna do is get that seat adjusted. I just want you up higher, upright, feeling comfortable, feeling good. You can adjust the steering wheel as well. On the bottom left side of it, there's a little latch. You push it down. You can pull it towards you, push it away, lift it up, lift it down, whichever one you want to do. Just make sure you latch it back closed because the vehicle will let you drive while it moves around. It's terrifying. All right, Jason, we feeling good? Yep. All right. So. Get your seatbelt. Exactly. That's exactly I'm what I was sorry. about to tell. Jason, I need wow. you to get it together. Okay? I don't have time to pick up the slack. I'm so, sorry. I just... Too. That's twice. So, yeah. that right there. <laughs> so, that right there tells me that Jason didn't read the iPad this yeah. morning. Did anybody read the iPad? I thought you were familiar. Yeah, it's okay. Don't ever test it. But with the iPad... <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. So, the iPad, what it tells you, because most of you didn't read it, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, we've had to read it. It's our job. It'll tell you that anytime you're in any of our vehicles, you have to have your seatbelt on. Mm -hmm. Even if the vehicle is off, doesn't matter. You have to have that seatbelt on every time you're in a Bronco. Another thing is, you have to drive with two hands all day. So none of this one hand trucker style driving. You're driving nine and three, two hands on the wheel all day. But when I have you steering, I want you to have your thumbs on the outside of that steering wheel. Why do I want your thumbs on the outside? Wheel yeah, break it? God forbid something were to happen, that wheel gets thrown, your thumbs get stuck on the inside of that, that is a very bad day for your thumbs. So trying to keep your thumbs on the outside as much as possible. Now I'm assuming you've done this in motorsports, I teach this at my other job, I teach high speed off-roading, we teach thumbs on the outside. Do this on-road as well. God forbid you get into an accident, it will keep you much safer. Now when we go to turn, I don't want you to cross over your arms, because if you think about it this way, if I have you rock crawling and I say turn, 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 keep the wheel like this, and continue on. And now we're rock crawling over big obstacles. I'm getting thrown around. Do I have a lot of control with a vehicle like this? No, right? So I want to shuffle steer. Has anyone done shuffle steering? All right, perfect. So can you explain shuffle steering? Yeah. Oh, not see. Oh. All... Two hands and you do this. Yes, that is Just perfect. Just like a cop. When they so drive. you're basically leaving your hands at the side of the steering wheel at all times. Your hands should never reach the top 
toward the bottom, they should always stay on the side. If I'm not mistaken, does driver's ed teach this nowadays? Mm -hmm. I believe so. No? Driver's ed's still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's on the computer. So, yeah, so how it works is you just want your hands to stay on the side at all times. So if I had to turn towards Ron, I'm going to pull down the wheel slightly with one hand, lift up. Pull down, lift up. Got to go the other direction, pull down, lift up. Your hands should always stay at the side of the steering wheel in the 10, 9, 8, 2, 3, 4 range. You never want to reach that top or the bottom. So that gives you full control. No matter how much wheel turn you have, no matter which obstacle you're going over, you have full control of that steering wheel. Because it will be very easy for that steering wheel to be ripped out of your hands today on the sum of the obstacles you have. So having that control really helps out. Now and if you decide. Lose stickers. Yes, and you'll lose stickers. And if you're with me, I will make fun of you in, in front of the entire group. No one is safe. So if you decide, I've been driving longer than this kid's been alive. I'm not going to listen to this shuffle steering garbage. I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna cross over my arms. Now you cross over the, your arms. You hit an obstacle, you get thrown forward because we're driving over obstacles all day. And your forearm is gonna make this sound, making contact with the horn. <laughs> now that sound right there, it's called the Bronco Bump. The Bronco Bump will get you a few things. First thing is, uh, made fun of me. Friend of the entire group. Second thing is, Ron will take away all your stickers. If you don't have any stickers, he does sell the ones he gets from you, the Yeti bottles. He takes those back. You can buy them back on eBay, $55. You can look up Ron's face, it'll pop up. So just making sure we're shuffle steering, going back to that safety. Uh, we do have a lot of technical trails that you could easily damage the Bronco. And obviously no one here wants to do insurance paperwork, so please. I'm going to be very annoying about that today. The best part about being newer to off-roading and being here with a big group is the vehicle in front of you is pretty much handing you your line and telling you where to go. The vehicle in front has no issues, gets through nice and easy, sweet, take that line. You're in the same type of vehicle. <laughs> now if the vehicle in front gets stuck, rolls off the mountain, is on fire. All right, pretty sure we can figure out what to do from there. So just uh, keeping that distance, very, very important today. And when you go out in the wild off-roading, it's a good thing to do as well. Now another procedure I'm going to be extremely annoying about, and you're going to hate me for this, is our parking procedure. So who here doesn't use their parking brake at all? All right, shame. Shame on you. The reason I say, oh, if it doesn't work, that's a different story. So if you have a parking brake and it works and you don't use it, shame on you. So you got the task. So what you're doing when you don't use your parking brake is you come to a stop, you mash it in the park, you shut it off, you get out, right? So what's happening in that type of situation is there's a gear inside your vehicle. So this is the gear cog. And once you throw it in the park, there's a parking pod the size of your pinky that gets thrown into that gear. The second you take your foot off the brake, that vehicle and the gear are going to try to roll away. And that parking pod is going to catch it. So now something the size of your pinky is holding the entire weight of your vehicle. When I explain it like that, it doesn't sound very safe, does it? Exactly. So what I want you to do instead is rest the entire weight on the parking brake. Your Bronco parking brake should work. If it doesn't, Good day. Okay, good. So you want to rest the entire weight on that parking brake instead because it's much stronger. It can handle that weight, and that's what it's there for. So we have to start off by knowing where the parking brake switch is. So where your left knee is located, you'll have that light switch dial. You go a little bit further down. There is a little switch. You go too far down. If you ever go to pull the parking brake and you pull this little number, you're gonna have you're gonna get out, do the Bronco Walk of Shame. You have to come to the front. Now, if you ever do this by accident. You can't just push it down, it won't reset the sensor, so you have to fully open it completely and slam it back down, and then it'll reset itself. I will be and then get in, and then Ron will make fun of you. So let's go back to this little parking brake switch. This is a switch. It is not like the old cable parking brake. If you pull this parking brake switch with the same force you used to with a cable parking brake, you will, and I promise, rip it out of the dash and hold it in your hand. That's why that silver one up there is parked up there. It doesn't have a parking brake switch. So, very gently, if you have a 21 or early 22 Bronco, it is a pull to engage, push to disengage. Now, if you have a late 22 Bronco or newer, we change the sequence, so now it is a push to engage, push to disengage. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of curveballs at you. So yeah, so for ours, it's gonna be pull to engage. So two things, we all heard that electronic noise. So anytime you go in gear, reverse drive or manual, you apply a little bit of throttle, it will automatically disengage that parking brake for you. If you are on level or somewhat unlevel terrain. If you are in extreme slope, the vehicle will not let you disengage the by throttle. You will have to do it manually. So right now, he was able to do it. Applied a little bit of gas and drive, boom. But we all saw that lunge forward, right? Now on off-roading, especially rock crawling, a game of inches and centimeters, that lunge forward can put us in a really bad situation. So today, please push it and take the parking brake off itself. Now if you're in your driveway and you need to 
to get out, a little bit of gas, boom. If you're gentle on the throttle, it will also release gently as well. It won't make you lunge every time. Now, Jason's been off-roading all day. He's tired. He wants to get out, stretch his leg. In order to park this vehicle, he's just not going to jam it in the park, shut it down, and hop on out. It's a four-step process. So his first step is he needs to engage the parking brake. So while he's in drive, he's going to go and engage the parking brake. All right, so we all heard that electronic noise. Now you want to double down by making sure it's on by also checking the red brake light on your screen. He sees that red brake light. Now, after that parking brake is on, he's going to shift into neutral. That's his second step. Now once he shifts into neutral, his third step is to take his foot off the brake. All right. Now we all saw how the vehicle settled right there. A lot of times people hear neutral, take your foot off the brake, Diego's standing in front of the vehicle, he's about to get sent home for being ran over. What happened there? Why did the vehicle not run me over? Parking brake. Exactly, yeah, that gear turned, but that parking brake caught it. So now that that weight is rested, now we can throw it in the park, and now that parking pod's getting thrown in between, and now there's no weight rested on it whatsoever. So this goes back to mechanical sympathy. We teach mechanical sympathy all day. We've had these Broncos for the last two and a half years. They've only done 4,000 or more hard miles on these trails. Most of them have never seen the asphalt. And we have had no issues. We haven't broken anything. You might be wondering, why is that? Why have they lasted to beat these things up every day? And they haven't even been broken in. It's because mechanical sympathy. We're gonna teach you how to treat your vehicle properly. There's a right way to rock crawl. You can be gentle to your vehicle, and this is a good start. This is a good foundation to build from. Now, this is not Bronco specific, this parking procedure. You could do it in any vehicle with a working parking and another reason why we do this is your safety net. Let's say you park on a slope and you don't have that parking brake on and that parking pod were to snap, well, your vehicle is <laughs> going to continue to roll till something stops it. Or let's say you live in Florida. It's a very flat area. I get the question all the time. I live in Florida. It's flat. Why the heck would I need to do that parking procedure? Well, what if someone runs into you? Well, that parking brake could save you from rolling into another vehicle or causing more damage, or that parking pod would just snap and continue to roll. Also, if you've ever parked on a slope before, and when you tried to get it out of park, it was really hard, and it made a really ugly grind as you did that. So what was happening in that situation is you were trying to slide that parking pot out from under the entire weight of your vehicle. Once you did that, all of it came together, and that gear dropped. This parking procedure will eliminate that forever. You won't have to deal with it ever again if done properly. It's awesome. So now the next thing we're going to talk about is turning. Something we have to worry about a lot today on our narrow trails. So let's say this rock that I'm standing on, I'm a tree. And Jason has to go through this section, so Ron is a tree as well. We have to make a turn in between us to go that direction. How far does this vehicle need to go past me before he starts turning that wheel? Are you going to want the wheel? That's technology. That's not bad. But we're just going to use technique. Nice and slow. Halfway, halfway okay. through. So we're talking quarter. maybe B pillar behind your shoulder. Yeah. All right. And not a bad idea. Any yep. uh, door? coffee drinkers? Okay, raise your hand, coffee drinkers. Alright, so you're in line at Starbucks <laughs> in your car. Jason is in line in, in the car. Okay? That'll give you a better visualization. So you're in the you're in the little the scoop. And these are the, the two trees that uh, you have to get through. Yeah, you've been to McDonald's, see the pole of many colors? <laughs> yes. Alright, what's that from? I wouldn't say side mirrors, mirrors, but I would say middle of the vehicle, back end of the vehicle. So what are people forgetting then? Why are we running into that pole? Yeah, they're forgetting that if you drive through a puddle, and then as you get out of that puddle, you make a turn, you're going to notice that there's all different types of tire marks. All four are different. So those back tires are not going to take the same path as the front. So you want to take a nice wide approach, especially for a vehicle like this. And that's what we have to do in this situation. Now we did put him right here in a very bad situation to make it more difficult. But that's why we want to focus on where we are going to go and turn. So if you were to go to your side view mirror and start turning at me, you're going to run over the tree. So if we go maybe back to the B pillar behind your shoulders, or maybe in this door range, maybe that could clear it. But then we also have to worry about Ron. Let's say Ron's not a tree. Let's say he's a cliff and you could drop half a mile down. Now you got to worry about it even more. So you could either decide tree, cliff, back up. Back up. You got a lot of options. Now in this case, I'm not going to let you back up because that's too easy and that's kind of cheating. But I just want you to really focus on when we're making turns today. And we talked about B pillar. 
That's what I like to do when I'm getting out of a parking space as well, is as I'm moving forward, wait till that B-pillar passes, and then I can start turning that wheel. So now I know I'm not gonna run into the vehicles next to me. So just having that spatial awareness. Now these side view mirrors right here, no one should be passing you today. So use them to your advantage. Aim them down as low as possible to your back tires. You wanna be able to see what's next to your tires, what you're climbing over or off of. So use both side view mirrors left and right for that. Now where are the side view mirror switches? Center console, why are the center console? Removable doors. Boom, there you go, removable doors, that is correct. Same thing goes for the window switches, right at that center console. So we're gonna do technique here. You're gonna do technique going through Ron and I. Hopefully you don't run one of us over. Then you're gonna enter through the left of these two trees. You're gonna wrap around clockwise. Now you are gonna have to do a three point turn. We're not gonna drift it. If you do a three point turn, you're gonna end up stopping next to that BF Goodrich sign when you're aiming at the pool. After that, then we're gonna use technology. Now what kind of technology do we have? You mentioned it. Yeah, the tire lock. Trail turn assist. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. It's live. So it's trail turn assist. Does anyone know how trail turn assist works? Yeah, it uses that ABS to lock the innermost wheel of the direction you're turning. So there's a three step process on how it works. First step is you gotta locate the button. It's on the top center of the dash on that hero button panel we talked about earlier. It's a picture of the chassis with a curved arrow off to the right. Now once you press that button down, nothing's gonna happen. You have to turn the wheel 80% or more to the direction you want to go in order for it to start locking your rear wheel. So if you're driving down the road, you hit that button, you make slight turns, nothing's going to happen. Now if you go to bust a U-turn, the second you do 80% or more with that wheel turn, that's when it's going to start locking that tire. Then your third step is keep a consistent, steady pace all the way through. Now it's not drift mode, it's not Ricky Bobby hopped up on Mount Dew mode. It cuts off at 12 miles an hour speed. So you can't go too quick, but you also can't go too slow, and you can't jab on and off the throttle. You have to have a consistent pace all the way through. If done properly, I'll stop you once you're next to the BF Goodrich sign. You'll do a perfect, beautiful U-turn around that tree without taking off any more bumps. Yep, you got it. So for right now, let's go ahead and start it up. Toss it in the drive. Go ahead and push the parking brake in towards the dash. All right, now really slowly, Try to get it between Ron and I going that direction without running us over. Why is your hand on the top of the steering? There it is. Oh, now your hand's on top. Now it's on top again. There you go. I knew you had it in you. Alright. Oh, oh, Ron is dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Ron is nimble. He'll, he'll jump over the hood if he needs to. Oh, you can't back up, you chicken. You gotta keep going for it. Oh, you didn't yeah. say that. <laughs> Jason, you're really rough around the edges, man. Keep going, though. You're good. That was a trap. You wouldn't have made it either way, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Alright, come on down. Now, are we going to go straight into this tree? Yeah. Probably, right? So we should go a little bit further up. So go ahead and go a little bit further forward. Alright, how are we feeling now? Hold right there. Alright, let's try it. Let's give it a shot. So, first things first, hit that button with the curved arrow off to the right. Boom, orange light comes on. Next step is he's going to rotate that wheel all the way to the direction he needs to go. And now what you're going to do is you're going to keep the turn the entire time. You're going to do a complete 180, and Ron's going to stop you when you get next to him. Good. Keep it consistent. You got it. trail turn assist, it's really hard to stay on the gas because you hear a lot of bad creaking noises, like the brake being cracked all the way through with the tire being Watch the rear inside tire right here. Watch how it's just locked in pace and that other one is getting all that power, getting all that rotation. Alright, I'm going to have everyone come on down here next to Brock. Even though trail turn assist is a great feature, a great piece of technology that they get from the competitive rock crawling industry and also the farming industry, don't use that on a trail if you don't need it. You have a great turning radius for the size of your vehicle. Try to use that to the best of your ability. Because if you think about a group of 20 Broncos and you go, everyone does trail turn assist through that turn. Well, now the vehicles behind you, maybe a Subaru Bronco Sport or a Bronco not on 35, is gonna struggle to get through your ruts. So just, I tread lightly, 
keeping yourself accountable and thinking, hey, I'm not the only vehicle out here. So trail turn assist is more self-healing terrain, like sand, snow, your neighbor's front lawn, yes. anything like that. <laughs> so talk to me about what you're looking at. We have a steep hill. What issues do we have with steep hills? Scary. The angle. They're scary. The angle. What's this? Loose, right? Loose gravel. Could be a jeep down there. Don't want to hit him. He's stuck, right? So we have all we have trees. We could have boulders. We do have boulders. All right. Oh, and by the way, as we come down. We, turn have, turn at the we have to turn at the bottom and go up. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we want to do is we want to get out either if we have a partner with us or if we are by ourselves, we want to get out and kind of take a look and understand. Because one of the things we don't want to do is come sliding down the hill and lose what? The car. The car. Life. Traction. <laughs> we want to be able to be in control, right? Kill your spotter. So, now, unfortunately, some of you only have seven. I, I get that, but in the automatic, and today, we have a manual gear. So when you pull it back, it's gonna stop and drive, and then you're gonna shift it into manual. Now, because of the way it's geared, it's gonna start in second gear, okay? So we're gonna take that little lever button that's next to our thumb, and we're gonna click it down to first. So we're gonna be in manual first, which is gonna give us Similar to what a tractor trailer would do coming down a large grade. Okay, you hear them wah wah. And they're using what? The engine to brake the unit to come down the hill so that they're not using their brakes. So, that is a technique that we can use. And we also have technologies that we can use. We're going to talk about those technologies later. But now, because you volunteered what? to come down this oh, hill, no. you are going to drive. So if I do this, what do you think that is? Stop. 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 Now, again, for our folks in Southern California, this is not a Hollywood stop. So we're not going to roll up to the stop. We are going to stop. Because you could be on a rock that you're coming off of or going into that is not going to be fun. So when we ask you to stop, we're asking you to stop now. Now, the one thing we're not going to do is we're not going to jump out of the bushes and go stop. Right? <laughs> we're not going to do that. But it is important. All right. What is this? Keep going forward. forward. Coming forward. What is this? Slow down. down. What is this? Slow way the hell down. <laughs> we might be going a half a mile an hour. And you're going to go, why is he telling me to slow down? There's a reason. Okay. Again, you saw Diego jump off when that unit compresses when that 5,000 pounds comes down we want to make sure that you roll the rock and you come down slowly versus jumping down and taking some of the undercarriage rock rails rear bumper spare tire we don't want those things coming off okay so if I go and point this way what do you think Turn, 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 driver. turn driver exactly good job so we're not turning left we're not turning right because we're going to be opposite so we're turning this way or driver this way or passenger okay if All i right. can add one more thing to that so when we tell you to turn that doesn't mean grab the whole wheel and just whip it to one side i want you to think of it kind of as a pizza with slices so just go slice by slice. So you're just going to turn a little bit, stop there. If I keep doing this hand gesture, turn a little bit more, turn a little bit more. And you kind of read our body language as well. Because if I'm just going like this, nice, easy, small turns. If I'm going like this and I'm kicking and doing all that fun <laughs> business, that means you need to start turning now and aggressively. Now, when we have you turn a little by little, if I go like this and then I throw one of these at you, that doesn't mean straighten out the wheel. That means keep it turned exactly where I have it. Keep moving in that direction. As a spotter, we have full control of the vehicle, so only turn the wheel when we tell you. Naturally, as drivers, you want to turn and then come back, and turn and come back, and that puts you offline. So just please keep it exactly where we have it, only move when we tell you. And if I'm spotting you, I know you probably have a passenger with you today, and you love that passenger. They're a great person, and you would listen to them any other day. But if I'm spotting you and I'm telling you to go one direction, your spotter's yelling at you to go the other direction, Please listen to the professional that's outside of the vehicle. <laughs> that's how damage has happened on this property. 
Now, if I'm not spotting you and your passenger's telling you to turn, all right, listen to me. But listen to the person that's always outside of the vehicle, because we can always see what's under and what's right in front of the vehicle, or if you're in the passenger seat or driver's seat, you're seeing the same thing, seeing the same thing. So just trust us, it's gonna do great. All right, let's crank it up. <laughs> what was our driver's name again? Amy. Amy. So what Amy's going to do in just a moment, she's just going to start up the vehicle. Now we're currently in four high, but to get into engine braking at a slow speed, at the slowest speed possible, we need to get into four low. How do I get into four low? Okay, so we're in four wheel high. So right now, to get into four low, we have to do a few things. First thing is, we have to be at a complete stop. Second thing is, we have to be into neutral, and then we have to press down on the four L button. Now anytime you're going in or out of four wheel drive low range, you have to be at a stop and in neutral. That is not the same for if you're going from too high to four high. You're staying in the same range and that drive shaft in the front is always still spinning. So you can do that on the fly while you're driving. But since you're going from high range to low range, you need to take the weight off that transmission, off that transfer case by shifting into neutral at a stop. So it'll always tell you shift slow to a stop and then shift to neutral. So once you're in four low by pressing down that button, orange light's gonna tell you it's on, boom, you're good. Now after that, we need to get in the manual. We got park, reverse, neutral, drive, manual. Now if you want to go into first gear and drive, that's perfectly fine. But the downside to that is as the vehicle goes up and revs, it's going to upshift you to the next gear. So you want to grab that gear shifter, shift into manual, put yourself into first gear. So now you're telling the vehicle in manual, I will upshift, I will downshift at that please. So manual is why that's so important. We have plus and minus on the left side of the gear shifter. We do not have paddle shifters on these Broncos. I believe your Everglades is the same with the plus and minus on the left side, so that's how you do that for that. Uh, for those of you in a manual transmission, screw all of this in the <laughs> crawler gear. We're not against hovering over the brake, but your job is to make sure you don't compress that brake. Because once you press that brake going down a hill, not in this case so much, but on a very long, steep descent, you're going to lock up the brakes, you're going to slide uncontrollably. So your job is to stay off that brake, let the engine slowly make its way down. Okay, so normally I wouldn't do this here, but Amy keeps asking me. Um, she says these tires are really low and there's a light on. It's concerning her. Why would we have low tire pressure? For risk. Right, traction. We're going to talk about it more, but when you get in your Broncos today, you're going to see the little horseshoe with the ripple strips that says, hey, all four of your tires are low. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. And they're there for a reason. They're going to be anywhere from 20 to 22. And that's a good sign. Um, you will have to keep hitting OK to get to your main screen because um, it will pop up. If you don't have a low tire pressure in your Bronco today, then you should you would be, be worried. Yeah. <laughs> 120 on the non -bead locks? So with bead lock capable like the ones we have, we, we vary from 15 to 25. Right. These are not bead locked. Technically, yeah. these are from factory, yeah. nothing done to them, so they're capable. Yeah. The only reason that Ford gives you the opportunity, um, the inside rim of it actually has the three drill holes. So you just have to get a different beauty ring to actually bolt it. They kept it beadlock capable, not beadlock for everybody, because certain areas like California, it's illegal to drive with beadlocks on the road. So once I say go, all I want you to do, put your feet flat on the floor. You're gonna do great, I trust you. He's been saying very great things about you. I'm so glad somebody trusts me. <laughs> all right, you ready? Yeah, that's great. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. You're gonna do great. Just stay on the trail. All you gotta do is steer. We can do everything else for you. So we're at four wheel low, manual first gear. So using the engine brake to control. You did not touch your brake. So right now we're just gonna let the torque in manual one four low crawl us up as far as it possibly can. What are we looking at here, folks? Uh, <laughs> Ruts, <laughs> bumps. What can we do? We can angle it, right? Kind of like low riders or you know <coughs> sports cars that need to go over speed bumps. How do they take it? Do they angle. take it? No, right, one tire at a time. So they crawl over it. Do we go fast or do we go slow? Slow. slow. Why? No need to go fast, and it's going to tear something up eventually. So we get a stick, we take a look. Is the water moving or not? I mean, those are concerns that we could have. If the water's moving, you know, 
even at four to six inches of water, five miles an hour, will move that 5,000 pound vehicle. Mm -hmm. right? Probably not a good idea. If you're on a trail and it looks like there's traffic been going, yeah, you know, but still get out and check. You don't know what's under there. It could be slick under there. There could be rocks under there. You know, this is, we can see this, right? So those are all concerns. What's the other concern we have as far as our Bronco goes? Getting stuck. Getting stuck, right? Getting water in places it shouldn't. Exactly, because that guy underneath there does not like water. Mm -hmm. Not outside water. Likes the water that's over here, doesn't like water, okay? So the rule of thumb would be anything from here down, you're probably okay. Probably. Now, if you look back and you take this line, oh, it's above the door. Mm -hmm. If you've got nice carpet, guess what you don't want inside? Water. Because it becomes mold and you cannot get it out. So, very important, you know, if you don't have to go through water. Now, when we come down the hill, do we want a SeaWorld splash? Or, you know, do we want, you know, hey, there's a manatee in the water, so we want to take it nice and slow. Right, we want the manatee approach. You know, we're going to have a little bow wave going. It's going to kind of push the water for us. We're going to run in the trough. Should keep the, you know, the water down below our axles, and we're good to go. All right. Since you like manatees, why don't you jump in and show us how to uh, right protect the manatees? Protect hey, the manatees. Right yeah, right. so, Going through these ruts and this water crossing, nothing too special. We're going to be in four low. When you turn off the vehicle and you turn it back on, it's going to stay in the same range you left it in. So all she's going to do is turn it on, shift the drive, take off the parking brake. Nice and easy through here. Go ahead and start it up. She has the automatic. All right, she has the she has manual. Oh, this is she was be looking for the clutch. <laughs> so your left foot just kind of hangs out there. It just does nothing. All right, so put on the brake. It's going to be an awkward day for some part. Break it off. Yes. Right. Go real low. Okay. Follow Diego. Nice and slow. Good shuffle steering. Well, she is going to Lake Mead. We are going to walk down and meet Diego on the other side. Very nice. of your safety net that's your lifeline so if you get stuck you could use it in that situation but also if you leave them on all day that's a lot of added stress to your vehicle that you don't need it wear it down. yes it would wear it down that's perfect <laughs> especially when you're trying to make a turn because we talked about differentials and what they let us do they let us turn at different rates of speed so the one on the outside has to get more rotations in well if i lock the differential they're going to rotate at the same speed so i'm going to lose out on that turn so that's another reason why but we can't use them we can be proactive or reactive. Proactive is if we turn one on right now and go through this trail and see what happens. Or reactive is we get momentarily challenged for a moment and we don't move. All right, well, we turn the locker on to get us through there and then we continue on after that. Now, lockers are a use it when needed type of thing, but you have to remember to turn them off when you're done through that obstacle. Because if you drive with them all day, it's gonna be a lot of added stress. So now we gotta look at line choices. What are we worried about when we're rock crawling? Big rocks. Big rocks. Yeah, if I can't avoid a big rock, I gotta go over it. If I can't straddle it, let me put a tire on because that gives me the most clearance. So big rocks. What about sharp rocks? What's the most vulnerable part of our vehicle? Tires. Yeah, the tires, especially the sidewall of that tire. 
So making sure we don't pinch that into anything as well. What about loose rocks? Things that I can climb over and easily slip off or move when I climb over. They can. So let's talk about from the front of the Bronco to me. Anything we're worried about? Or we think we're good? We just try. This right here? The middle one. The middle one. Right here? That one. Uh, what are we in? A Prius? We got clearance. We're an off-road vehicle. Come on. Yeah, but it, I mean, you should put it in the middle. <laughs> yes, I love that. Put it in the middle. What about this one? Middle? Yeah. All right, cool. We'll keep on moving. All right, now what about right here? Round of a heavy stand right there. All right, so from Ron to myself. Now what do we have to worry about? Yeah, these big rocks on the side. I like it. Put a tire on the rocks? Yeah, I like it. I like that idea. Just keep it on the high point. But the, there are a few things we have to take into account if we do that. If I, if I put my driver tire right here, as I press over, my back tire, since I'm in a four-door and not a two-door, my back tire and my control arm might be getting hung up on that holder. No, you're fine. <laughs> you can sit there. So I would move over just a little bit. Let's find that happy medium where we put our driver tire right here. So as we progress, we come up with this side. Yeah, most definitely. You do want to walk the line. So <laughs> what we're doing right now, we got to check out the lines before we drive over. Because it's not drive by braille. You got to you gotta know. All right, so feeling pretty good. Ron, any ideas? We, we're good here? I think we're good. All right, I like it. We're solid. So let's crest over the hill then. Now once you crest over the hill, what are we looking at? Any issues? Any scary things? This right here? Maybe this, uh... Maybe this rock right here that has a lovely white powder on it. By the way, that's not a natural thing. What do you think that's from? Straight bottom. bottom. Those things. <laughs> no, that's in town. So, no. So how this is happening is people put their driver tire right here or right here, and they fall off of this rock. And when that happens, the suspension compresses, the bash plate lands on the beautiful boulder, and ta-da, we have a lot of scuffs on it. So how could I avoid this? Put the tire, put the tire on, on it. There you go. I like it. Let's put a tire on it. Where's your other one going to go? Yeah, now we got to think about it. Now we kind of got to split this rock into three sections. So if we put the right side, middle, and left. Right side, you can see people up with their tires here, but they'll still slide off on this curved edge. But now if they go to the left side, my driver tire's here, my passenger tire's way off trail now, and I'm going to get hung up middle? on the other. Yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. Put it dead center in the middle, so now my passenger tire is going to be driving on the peak of that rock. So now we can straddle this whole area. If we go down this nice and easy, bada bing, bada boom. Set. Any other issues down here? Just Jesus take the wheel. Jesus take the wheel. I like it. Let's do that. And then over that drop, that's the, our problem when we get there. By the way, everybody, that is Bill. He is our professional photographer. <coughs> All right, let's boogie. drive through water up there and our tires are a little slick and we slid off the rock 
Any issues? Doesn't seem like really. you heard anything. Yeah, nothing too big of a deal. We got a little bit of a tire lift over there, about an inch or two. Pretty mellow, pretty simple. You got uh, we could use some technology, though. You mentioned it earlier. David, what was it again? Sway bar disconnect. I've never heard of that. Never heard Sway of that. Bars. There you go. Stabilize. You've got to stay on Stabilize. brand. Sorry, we call there it Sway. So stabilizer bar. Is it the same thing as a sway bar? Yes. But <laughs> So there's a stabilizer bar in the Broncos. Now what it does on road is it limits your body roll. So it limits the articulation of your suspension. So as you go through turns, you don't have a lot of body roll, a lot of movement, because that's dangerous. So on road, it's great, like every other vehicle. But when you're off-roading, there's a downside to that. We want that full range of motion with our suspension. We want that articulation. We want our suspension to move as freely as possible. And it can't do that because it's being held together by that stabilizer bar. So what we want to do is we want to disconnect that so now left and right suspension components can move as freely as possible and get their full range of motion. How to do that is the Badlands First Edition and Bronco Raptors all have the stabilizer bar disconnect. It's located on your hero button panel, top center of the dash, First one on the left. Press that button down for me. All right. So we all kind of we all saw it settle, right? I like to call it the low rider button. You hit the button, it's, it drops. So how that works? Now that suspension can move as freely as possible, and we saw it happen right then and there. That is called being under load. So mid obstacle, we hit that button, it disconnected, and now we're good. We can move as freely as possible. The reason we do this under load and on this obstacle instead of doing it back there is those four-letter J-word vehicles, they have to be at a stop and on level terrain to disconnect their sway bar. Ford obviously had to one-up them because it's a competition. And now we can do it while we're in motion. We can do it while we're under load mid obstacle, which is really cool. And now we have even more suspension, or er, more ground clearance as well. You're doing a great job. You're doing great. Let's keep on going. So I have a question on the, yes. I call it sway bar too, I just stabilize the bar. Uh-huh. If you just disconnect it, does it make the tire move the suspension components move more independently, so technically the tire would move independently. So one could turn at one rate, one could turn at the other. No, no, no. Oh, okay, okay. 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 Alright, watch, watch this spot. Okay. He's the professional. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing. Is there any reason you turn it back on? My suggestion is anytime you're going to hit dirt, just turn it on. It makes for a much smoother ride rock rolling, but also just on dirt trails like this. Just gives you that one freedom. Um, but one, not really. And it also reconnects at 20 miles an hour in the Broncos. So there's a speed limit. So once you hit 20, it's going to reconnect. They did that as a safety feature because they don't want you to drive on road with that. Oh, we're going to go up the rock still. As you press over, you're going to see Johnny and he'll let you know where to go from there. We're not doing that in the main. Go over to your right side. Yes. Covering the brake. But not in the main. Once you press over, you're going to see Johnny and he'll You wouldn't stall out too much faster, right? Yeah. Now with the crawling mode. So he's in four low, manual one right now.
And then things such as how our vehicles are at, equipped, right? Maybe you have a 37 inch tire on your front door. Maybe you have the catalog bolted to the roof rack. That's going to increase that center of gravity. Generally, from a 25 to 30 range is your extreme caution range, okay? Especially in the Sasquatch configuration. So the Bronco is actually fairly stable in this configuration at this slow speed. Now, our property is pretty unique. The way we end up into this particular situation on this property today is if we're driving down the trail, we sometimes see a rock on the side of that trail and we try to avoid that rock. And in our effort to avoid that rock, we unintentionally drive up the shoulder of the trail because a lot of our trails are in these little washes. And a lot of times our attention's focused on one thing, but we don't realize that we're putting ourselves into a more risky or unsafe situation or scenario. So our request from you today is um, trust your guides, trust your spotters. Um, but if you get into a spot that feels really, really weird, just stop. Grab the radio that's in your Bronco and say, help, and we'll come <laughs> running over to help you out, okay? So um, if something doesn't seem right, communicate. A lot of times we're new to this, right? We're introducing you to a lot of different things, but if something's kind of questionable, it's okay to ask questions, right? We want you to ask us questions. Front locker, pulling. Rear locker, pushing, all right? So now answer my question. We're going up the hill. Do you want to pull yourself up the hill, or do you want to push yourself up the hill? Well, you know, uh, with the rocks, I would think that you want to pull yourself up. Okay. Very good. Because the loose gravel is behind you. Okay. We'll give it a shot. That's what they're saying. So let's uh, find your front locker. Yeah. Wait, can we expand on that real quick, though? So I like your, your thought process here. Let's think about our vehicle for a minute. Okay, we got a lot of weight on the front axle. What else? It steers. It steers, okay? Why does that matter? What happens if I lock up my front axle? Yeah, the steering gets limited, right? So it might work if I'm going straight in and I need a little bit more climb on the front. That's a good approach to it. But a lot of times I might want to make steering inputs and make some adjustments there. And if I have that front locker engaged, I can bind my steering up and my steering becomes limited. The other difference I want to point out, that rear axle is what we call a solid axle. It's a big, heavy tube, beefy axle. The front axle, that's an independent suspension, right? There's a lot more moving components. Those components are smaller. So if we apply that locker and make that front end do a lot of work, why it's carrying all that weight, we're gonna add a little bit more fatigue to that front end with where we can make the back end do the work the majority of the time. We have both, but generally by default, I wanna make the heavier duty parts do the work, and then if I need an assist for that, then that front locker is a great assist. Does that make sense? So we could drag it up through there with the front locker, absolutely. We can engage that rear locker. Our concern here is that loose gravel, right? So if I get one tire jammed against the rock, that other tire is in the gravel, that gravel is going to spin, I'm going to lose traction. So if I get both those tires equal power, that can help push me up the hill. Push on the rock. <coughs> Ready? Go. Yes. All right. This is the start of the show. We're judging. You want me to keep going? Yeah, Ron's got you. So tire placement is definitely important, right? Someone mentioned putting their tires on the rock. Avoid the rock? If you don't put a tire on the rock and you're putting your tires on the sides of the rock, where's the rock going to go? No, it's okay. Right? Come on. There's all rocks with dip hangers. So hit that rear differential and you'll look good. Oh, it's done. Nice and steady. Good. Keep coming. Nice and steady. Nice and steady. Little so driver. Very good with this throttle control. Driver's not too oh. aggressive in the gas pedal. Come on. Driver's side. Turn throttle. See how he eased over that? Yeah. If he would have got a little heavy footed and pushed that gas pedal harder, those tires would have broke loose. 
a little lost traction. Easing into that gas pedal, get that vehicle and those tires to do the work for us and just grip and climb right up over. That's a good technique. Nothing right here. We're good. Okay. Let's see in the ground school. We learned up now? Yeah. Ready to get in a Bronco? Yeah. So now that everyone's all caught up, we're going to use a piece of technology going through this trail. So I want you to look at the middle button in that goat mode dial. It's a little Bronco icon. So that little square Bronco icon in the middle of your goat mode dial, I want you to press it down just once. Once you press it down, look at your screen, you're going to see trail one pedal drive active. And now you're going to see a green foot on a pedal next to your zero in miles per hour. Now if you see that green foot, take your foot off the brake pedal. So the reason I had you take your foot off the brake is you don't need it anymore. In one pedal drive, the mode we're currently in, as you'd expect, you're only going to drive with one pedal. So all you have to do is apply throttle and steer. Anytime you apply throttle, it will slightly release the brakes. Anytime you come off the throttle, it will apply the brakes again. You have to put more pressure on the pedal to make it go. It's actually kind of like an electric vehicle, where like literally the minute you take it off, it stops. Mm -hmm. So on this trail, it does get somewhat narrow. I want you to make sure you stay in the middle of the trail. Just stay dead center. You don't need to veer to the left or the right side, because that's when you go into the bushes, the trees, and you start killing that landscape. It all comes back to that tread lightly. We are the ones that built these trails. We are the ones that maintain them. And we love the beautiful landscape around us. We want to make sure that we don't run into it and kill it.
that first initial press, put us in the one pedal drive. Our just the braking for us, it's that green foot, let's pedal. Now once we were in one pedal drive, if we were to hit step one, that is what transferred us over from one pedal drive to trail control. Now there is another piece of technology called hill descent control, which we will use a little bit later. But for now, let's go ahead and turn trail control off by hitting that middle button in the GoPro top. Once you hit that button, you are back on the gas and the brakes. You will no longer see a green foot, a green number, a gray foot on a pedal. It is all clear off your screen now. So we're going to go straight past this entrance to the Raptor Lodge because that's none of our business just yet. But in the parking lot, that's when we're going to make a left to enter. We're going to go right past all of your rental or personal vehicles. I know we've been going slow, we're doing tonight, for low driving. Now let's go to four high. So put on the brake, shift into neutral, press down on that four H button for you. That light's immediately going to start blinking. It should take only about five to ten seconds before that light becomes solid. If it doesn't, if it takes quite a while, 15, 20 seconds, then look at your screen, it might tell you shift to late drive forward. All right, so we're going to get going in just a moment. Your job is to keep up, not crash, not jump, and not pop the tire. How are we going to do that? Well, first thing is, you see a big jump or a deep rut, go slow. It's not going to feel great. The Bronco can handle it. Your back, not so much. If you go fast over any rocks, you might pop a tire. Obviously, that's not going to be fun, because I don't change any tires. It's actually your guys' job to lead the tire changing class if you pop your Bronco's tires. When Ford was trying to make this experience, they went to a bunch of different driving experiences and tried to pick out the best pieces of each one. And then they also knew that they're making a Bronco, an off-road capable vehicle. So people are going to get these vehicles and go explore. So Ford said, all right, let's not only teach them about their vehicles, but let's teach them how to prepare themselves to go off-road. So we're going to talk about journey essentials here. Just plan <coughs> accordingly, do your research, don't be spontaneous, don't just leave in the morning and just start driving. Figure out how long the trail is going to be. Start the trail with a full tank of gas. Bring food, water, sunscreen, hats, tools. Don't think, oh, I probably won't pop a tire. No. Always think, I am going to pop a tire. That's going to help you out the most. It's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Boom. True. That's the last thing I'm going to throw out there. Right. And we're going to lunch. I actually do not mind the four door as much as I thought I would. Yeah. Well, because this part of it feels exactly the same. Now, as we go up this bottom of Gunshot Trail, we're going to run into two steep descents. First one is going to be a little rocky waterfall one. When you go down these two descents, I need you to go as slow as you possibly can. If you go too fast, you're going to compress that suspension on the front end. You will know that as the vehicle into the ground. Speaking from experience, it does not feel very good. So we're going to be making a right up ahead, and then we're going to be going down another steep descent. This steep descent, even when you go slow, you're only about an inch off the ground with your front bumper. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's crazy. Whew. Cruising. 
We're going to go slow past the pavilion and also go slow when we pass that base camp area. Just so we don't dump that, everybody. Make sure you have that vehicle behind you. You should always see Bronco behind you, of course, unless you are the one in the back. Alright, so once you make a right before that big Bronco off rodeo sign, we're going to get into our ride and handling portion of the day. So we are in four high, or at least you should be. We're going to start picking up the speed a little bit. Now with our ride and handling course, we do want you to go a little bit quicker, but still drive with caution. There's a lot of blind corners. You don't know if it's going to be a sharp turn or a stopped vehicle on the other side. So drive with caution, but let's start picking up that speed. Alright, 
So now that we've all made it to the end of that trail, let's go ahead and turn hill descent control off. So how to do that is just how you do with any other technology. And that comes from the Bronco button, I mean. Hit the Bronco button. Once you do that, you should no longer see that gray zero, that blinking speedometer, blinko, blinking Bronco icon on your screen. Now everyone should still be in four low. You should be in drive currently. If you're in a Badlands Bronco, you should have your stabilizer bar disconnected. We are currently going to be entering Tree Stump Trail. Now Tree Stump Trail, as you'd expect because we're not very creative, consists of a tree stump at the start of the trail. Your goal is to put your passenger tire front and rear on that tree stump. If you do that, you'll get a nice little wheel lift. You're going to get a few wheel lifts and side tilts and all that fun stuff on this trail. Just remember, when in doubt, always steer downhill. Your brain tells you to turn uphill. That's the worst thing you can do. Always go downhill, go with gravity, and be very gentle on the throttle on the brakes. All right, come on down. All right, so I'm going to have everyone roll down their two front windows for me, just so I can communicate to you. I'm going to be spotting you through some of these seconds. Pretty much just one, but I just want you to be able to hear me. Because his feet are right there. Yeah, you don't want to squish yeah. his feet. If yeah. you, I like walking. It's yeah. kind of like my thing. Devin? <laughs> Slow. You're I'm a great passenger. <laughs> he is a great passenger. All right, now we're at the top. Now slow on the way down. Oh, my God. I'm Stop kidding. that! <laughs> <laughs> He's not walking anymore. So your middle button in the manual transmission, you don't have the one pedal of the trail control that you have to get into in order to get into that with the automatic. So your middle button, Press it down, they'll descend control right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so for you guys, it's way easier. Okay. And, and then the you automatic. Put crawl gear and it. Yep. And it just does the same. And it, yeah. won't, it won't stop. Nope. In the crawler gear, it won't stop. If you try to do that in first gear, he'll descend control, it is so slow that it can't stop. Oh, if you're going up a hill, it's slow, right? And it can stop the car? With the crawler gear? Yes. Yeah. With so the crawler. Well, you won't be in hill descent control going up a hill. No, I'm just saying if it's like a, like a ridge or so the hill descent control has such a low ratio that it shouldn't stall when going up the hill if it stops. But if it does stall for any reason, you can quick start it, which is also a pretty nifty little feature of that thing. You keep the auto stop start on, it'll automatically do it for you. There you I go. I learned that. Okay. Now we got to decide how the hell we're going to get to this. So well, what lines are we thinking? Also, remember that the line you choose and you say, I'm going to put you on that exact line. So whether or not it's a good line, we're going to take it. Right in the high line, so right here, right here, maybe step down to this one. Alright, I can dig it. I like it. There's tire marks here, so that tells us people have done that. <laughs> Alright, what else? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a loose. Well, I, I see the gears turning to the heads. I'm not hearing it. Bueller. Bueller. Probably ride Which tire? Driver or passenger? Uh, passenger tire. Passenger tire. And you running it straight down like that? Yeah, maybe like uh, left, 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 left of the one you just stepped on. Up. Yeah, so right here. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, so passenger driver's gonna be right here, keeping it on the high line. I think that could work as well. All right, so we got some options. So we got on the big rocks over there for one. We got this line off to the side. What seems like the most interesting one, the most fun? Right? Yeah. That way? All right. Oh, the regular road? Yeah, we don't want that. That's the Jeep road. So, these rocks right here. Yeah. So these rocks right here, these big ones, that's, I would say, the most interesting line. Gives you a nice little wheel loop to enter. I'll probably put most of you on that line. But then we also have this option. If you want to try this line, I could take you on this line right down here. We can see how that plays out. I'm perfectly fine. But now, we got these lines kind of settled. Now let's look down here. Because if we were to drop into this edge, that's, that's fairly deep. We could easily catch an edge on that. But also, if we drop our driver tire here, and our passenger tire's over there, we can get hung up and scrape the bad plate yeah, on the rocks that are right here in the middle. So, yeah. all right, driver tire, ride the high line, go along the edge. All right, I can take it. So, lead Bronco. I'm gonna have you hop in, and we're all gonna stay out and watch and problem solve as you drive through. All right, so only turn when I tell you, so you keep turning back. Keep it that direction. More, more, more. All right, keep it going that way. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put your passenger tire up there on those big rocks. You're good, keep moving forward. I'll verbally spot you since you can't see me in some of these sections. Nice, all right. Now nice and easy. Keep on creeping forward. All right, now I'm gonna hold you right there. Good, now give me just a little bit turn towards that driver's side. That's good there. Keep moving forward. Nice. Now give me more and more driver. Nice. Hold right there. Give me quite a bit driver now. I love it. Now you got to go really slow right here because that passenger tire is about to drop on a foot and a half of a just straight vertical drop. So now nice and easy, ride the brakes on the way down. Slower. Nice. Keep going that direction as well. I'm going to scoot out of the way a little bit. Good. Now start making your way back. That's good right there. Keep going that direction. Nice and slow. Keep driving those brakes. Good. Nice. Great job. You're going to come right next to me. So turn back this way. That's good. Keep going that direction. Give me a hair that way. That's good right there. Perfect. Keep going. Okay, so keep the tire exactly where it's at the entire time. Good, good, good. Ride the brakes hard. Slower, slower. Beautiful. Alright, you're on your own. I'll let you know when to stop. Alright, Bronco 2, hop on in. Nice. Start coming back my way. That's good. Keep going. Oh my goodness, hit the brakes. Alright, now is our time. Let's break. Alright, so first thing we need to do is stop the wheel from rotating and then decide, okay, what do we use in this situation? Now we have, technically we're cross-acting. So your front left and your back right tires are both losing traction. Power's getting sent there and we're stuck momentarily. Let me get a sweep. So, what could we use? Where's it go when it goes back? Front locker. Huh? If it has oh, it. no, let's use a lock. I forget we have. Well, which one? Okay, front Hi, David. Uh, Hi, honey. So the way I like to think about it is when it comes to lockers, and I didn't talk about this earlier, and I definitely should have, and that's on me. So lockers is a rear is going to push you through an obstacle while front will pull you. I like to default to our, my rear more than anything. And I like to think about it if I had to move a big tire going uphill. I am a lot stronger <laughs> with my legs, so I can use my legs to push the tire uphill instead of having to pull it uphill. So right, it would be a lot easier. So that solid rear axle on the back end is a lot stronger and a lot easier to move us through an obstacle, and that's why it's going to push us much beefier and stronger. Where your front, a little bit more dainty, a little bit more you have to worry about in a certain situation. So right now, I'd actually use my rear. All right, now very gently, come forward. And hold. Now for now, we'll leave it on for just a second. Hang out here.
right now, slow on the way down because that front passenger tire has got to drop quite a bit. Slow, slow, slow. Nice, good control. Keep on coming nice and easy. Slower. Keep that steady compression on that brake. This is when you talk about the two foot thing, right? Yes. You don't have to let the brake in a situation like this because you don't have to worry about your right foot being on the gas. So you could use your right foot for brake. I just like to use the left so I get more comfortable with it. that consistency being The only reason I ask is I would literally not even take the gas on this. So I would just let oh, yeah, gravity you, take nope. it down. Yeah, you don't need to apply any throttle on this whatsoever. Like right now, he's just going on the brake, coming off little, on, off. Good. Nice, slow on the way down. It's going to dip. You got another wheel whip. That was cool. Start coming back to your passenger side. Bada bing, bada boom. You're all set. Come on out of here. Yeah, it's the most fun way. Now, nice and slow on the way down right here, because that tire's now going to get that drop. Good. Come back this to here. Perfect. Good control. Nice and slow. Good job. Good line. gonna run me over you're not I trust you <laughs> start making she your way a little bit not more ready right for side. that there right you go. on nice and easy well done. Oh. all right next Currently what I am driving is a white four-door wild track Bronco. Sorry, the Bronco in front of us like dipped down a lot. I thought it was gonna tip for a second, it freaked me out. So I don't know the year, it is a hard top, and I'm thoroughly enjoying the suspension. I think it's awesome. All the Broncos here are automatic. I was kind of looking forward to trying a manual. Oh my god. Oh, sorry. I was looking forward to trying a manual, however, unfortunately, they don't have it, but that's okay because I'm trying something new and I'm learning about the Bronco Automatic. So, I am terrified right now, by the way, because what they're having people do is crazy. Locking differential. Keep trying it one more time. There it is. This one white wild track has been making that bind the last time. Yeah, that's awful. It's been on the left side mainly, but now it seems like it transferred over the red. Front locking differential. <laughs>
did it that way the entire time. And that's good. That's a start. Now keep creeping forward little by little. There's a lot of beautiful dirt roads that we can go pick up speed on. So let's go back into Fort High. So this is going to be a 25-30 minute off-road recovery discussion. I like to talk, say it's a talk. Off-road classes take at least five days. Winch classes alone take about three. So no way, shape, or form is this the last thing you should ever hear about off-road recovery and then say, oh yeah, I'm good, I'm set for the rest of my life. No, not at all. This is skimming the surface, talking about the basics of the basics. Um, so yeah, we'll start with self-recovery and then we'll morph into multi-vehicle recovery. So a good start is, for bare minimum, a shovel. Now, a shovel is a pretty easy thing to understand how to use. You've all used one before. For a recovery situation, if you're deep into the ground, you could dig yourself out. Let's say you live somewhere where you could dig a cat hole to go to the restroom. Boom. If you have an annoying passenger, wham, and you can hide the body. <laughs> now, you can go the expensive route or the cheap route. It's up to you. Uh, I suggest short handle, of course, because it's much easier to keep inside your vehicle. And a long handle is just very awkward to maneuver when you're laying under your vehicle trying to dig yourself out. The cheap route, 10 $12, probably at a Home Depot or Lowe's, works perfectly fine. You can get the fancy ones that are for different types of terrain. There's some that are half axe, half shovel, some that have the three prong on the side if you're in more gravel-ish terrain. Uh, I have one you can pop off the handle, put glow sticks and zip ties, there's some that you can fold in half. So really up to you, but a bare minimum as an off-road recovery equipment is a shovel. Now step up from a shovel. Is these fancy looking things. Anyone know what these are called? Oh, those are awesome. Yeah. Recovery boards. Yeah, recovery boards, traction boards, traction pads, whatever you'd like to call them. So, before there were traction boards, there were a lot of ways that people would get unstuck. Like using slabs of carpet, using your uh, floor mats in your vehicle, a 2x4, two 2x4 two and chain, a bunch of options. This is the safest option to get yourself unstuck nowadays. Now, how do you think this works? Anyone have any idea of how this works? All right, perfect. So what I'm gonna have you do, I'm gonna have you grab this traction board and we're gonna get this vehicle right here, our tail Bronco number six. That one's stuck deep into the ground. It needs to move forward. Is, so I want you to- Is it stuck in the front or the back? Both, all four. You were actually right. So what you'd want to do is you want these teeth going up towards the sky. Oh. Now, if we're, if we're looking at the traction boards like this, now, if we are looking at this, which side should I tuck into the tire if I'm trying to get it unstuck? The ramped edge, right? If you couldn't figure out it's a ramped edge, you flip it over, it even says ramp aiming downhill. So it gives you a heads up. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah, you can get away with doing that in a lot of different ways, but the but it, proper I mean, way, I guess you could say, is this one. But I can see how you put it down because it would... Yeah, the only, the only downside to doing that is if I try to tuck this into a tire, I have nothing for my, the tread of my tire to grip onto. And that's why we want it upside down, or proper way, but upside down from that way. So how it's set up there, you want to tuck in this little ramped edge with all these teeth into that tire. Because what you're doing here, and why all these teeth are at the bottom and not up here, is you're trying to initiate that traction. So as you slowly rotate your tire, the tread of your tire is going to grab onto these teeth, and that's what's going to cause it to rotate under your vehicle. Now, there are traction boards like these. ARB does make them. These are called ARB Tread Pros. We're partnered with them for this experience and with the Bronco. There are companies that put those little teeth on the bottom as well, so they do dig into the ground. So there are traction boards like that that you might have, and that's why they're double-sided. There's also traction boards that will have ramped edges with all these teeth, 
on both sides so you can use them for any type of direction. But these are directional, so you'd want to tuck this in towards the tire and go nice and easy. Now if I'm stuck and I need to get out, I'm annoyed, I want to get out of this recovery as fast as possible, should I just slam on the gas? Should I just pin it? No? Alright, you're saying no, how come? Uh, because your tires are just going to keep spinning, you're not going to give it the ability to actually uh, get that for the traction. That's yeah. What I was yeah, exactly. Perfect answer. So if I do a burnout on this, I'm not giving the tread of my tire enough time to latch onto these teeth. So if I do a burnout on it, then I'm just going to spin tires and I can rip off these teeth. Once I rip off these teeth, this traction board is pretty much useless at that point because it's smooth. I can't have nothing to get that traction. So you want to go nice and slow. But also, you want to go slow because if I were to do, you know, Vin Diesel, Fast and the Furious mode, slam on the gas, and I do get traction, these boards are going to get launched. Now, they could become a projectile, they can go into another person, another vehicle, or in my case, you could uh, be on one of our trails and it's pouring rain and you have to take a group up a trail. And every single person needed traction boards to get up. So I go to my Bronco number eight, and I remember this like it was yesterday. I got a stern talking to for it. And I say, hey, traction board tucked under your tires. Nice and easy with the throttle. You'll get unstuck, and you'll keep on moving. What did they hear? Let's see how fast you can spin the tire. So they slammed on the gas. These boards, well, not these specifically, but these types of boards both got launched, went off the edge because there was a clip on both sides. And we still have yet to find them. That was about a year and a half ago. Uh, so yeah, we got lucky it didn't go into another vehicle because that would have been a lot worse. But we lost those traction boards because they got launched. So making sure that you go as slow as possible. Take the time to let those tread of the tire grab onto the teeth. Now if we have a four-wheel drive vehicle, ideally how many boards should we have? Four. Four. Yeah, in a perfect world. But a lot of people only go with a pair just of two. And you can do a lot with that. You could get away with having two. I've had two for most of my life. Uh, but there's a good reason to have four. Now, if you have one on each tire, that's very helpful. What you could also do is these traction boards nest together so you can stack them on top of each other. And if you needed to get over a bridge, normally not this long, far away, but you can nest them together, drive your vehicle over. It could also be used as a ramp if you don't have the clearance for something. And if you put these on the outside of your vehicle, you look super off-roady. That's a joke. But uh, yeah, so these are ARB tread pros. They're very, very helpful. Uh, you could also create what we call a railroad system if you have four. And what happens is, let's say your two front tires keep getting stuck. You use a traction board, you get unstuck. The second you come off the board, you get stuck again. So what you do is you put two on each side in a straight line. You get unstuck with the initial traction board. As you step onto the next one, now that traction board takes its place. So it creates essentially a railroad system for you. We had to do that here on this location. We opened about four months ago. We were closed for a month in the winter months. When we opened on Friday, we had two feet of snow everywhere. So we had to come in the day before and go check out all the trails. So we all brought our own personal traction boards and all the ones we have on our property. I believe we had a total of 20. On one of our trails, it took us six hours to go less than a quarter of a mile. And we had to do that railroad system the rest of the trail. It was terrible. It's not ideal, but it'll get you home in a pinch. Uh, why would you use front tires versus rear tires? When would you? I uh, assume they're all stuck equally. Depends. It's it's situational, but a lot of times, if I need to go a specific direction, like if my tires are pointing a specific direction, and I need to go that path, and I need it to pull me that direction, I'm going to use the traction boards with the front tires so I can get pulled that way. Yeah. Now, if I'm just trying to get moved forward, I like to resort always resort to the rear axle. The rear axle is much stronger, much beefier. So I would like for those tires to rotate, gain that traction and push me out of that also. So situational for sure. Or should we even turn on the locker? You could turn on a locker to help you out in this situation. The rear axle, you turn on the one the back one so they push you. So you wouldn't have to turn on a locker in some of those situations, but then there are some that you would. Because okay. either or the rear Axle is just going to push you because that's your powerhouse mainly. That's your strong, beefy axle. Where you just have your front axles, your half shafts, it's a little bit weaker. So your rear is pretty much always just pushing. Like think of a rear wheel drive vehicle. It's pushing your vehicle forward at all times. Front wheel drive, it's always pulling your vehicle forward. Does that make sense the other way? All right, cool. Um, but yeah, now these traction boards are about 375 bucks a pop. A lot of times people say, well, I don't want to spend that much money because I really doubt I'm going to use them. Well, I want you to think about it like this. Let's say you go off-roading, you don't bring anything, uh, and you start just driving out there. 
you get stuck in the middle of nowhere, you have no service, you start hiking away from your vehicle, you get service, you try to call AAA. AAA is not going to come get you. They only drive about a foot off road and tell you you're too far away. So you'd have to call an off-road recovery group. Now, if you're lucky, there might be an off-road recovery group in your town that does it for free. If you're lucky, we have one in Vegas called SNOR, Southern Nevada Off-Road Recovery. They do it for free. They barely even accept tips. They'll just come get you, save you wherever you're at. They'll do trail repair on your vehicle and help you get to safety and just send you on your way. It's awesome. Other people, they will charge you quite a bit. They're going to charge you how long it takes to get to you, how long it takes to get you out, if they have to do any maintenance on your vehicle. They're going to charge you for all that. I see bills up to $10,000 for people that have been turned off before. It's ridiculous. So you could just spend 375 bucks, keep it in the back of your vehicle for a rainy day. It'll help you out in the long run. So good investment for sure. Now, what is this for? Why do I have this? I was kind of messing with it. How do you think it's here? I'm going to assume it might be for a winch. Not quite. Sand for a vehicle? Oh yeah. So Sand or mud. So yeah, kind of sand or mud. It's just basically when you get uh, unstuck. So my Bronco's stuck. I need the traction board to take my place. I get unstuck. The traction board did take my place, but now it's deep into the ground. So what this is, it's a leash that you throw off to the side. Once you throw this leash off to the side, once this board goes deep into the ground, this stays on the surface. So instead of having to dig deep into the ground for it, you just pull it out. You can use shoelace, paracord, a rope, really anything for it. It's really nice. The main thing about these that I never, ever want to see is this. I like to make this example because I've seen this. I never want you to tuck your traction board in there. I don't want you to hold on to it, and I definitely don't want you to do this. I've seen this. Now, what do you think is going to happen when that tire rotates? Yeah, the cartoon banana peel slide where it just goes whoop. Yeah, that's going to happen. They're fine, I promise, but that was a really funny thing. To watch. So, yeah, just having that common sense. Uh, you don't want to be holding on to any moving components, of course. Now, still on the topic of self recovery, and it kind of moves into multi vehicle is this little bright short strap. What do you think this is? What is this called? Tree saver. Tree saver, yeah. A tree saver, a tree strap. So why would I have a tree saver? What does it do? I know it's a stupid question. It's gonna have a simple answer, but what does it do? It's a red line tree. Yeah, exactly. So, who here has seen the original Jurassic Park? All right, Probably. I hope everybody. So in the original Jurassic Park, Newman, I don't remember his name, but that's how I remember him. So, yeah, so Newman, he steals the dinosaur embryos, runs to his Jeep, gets in the Jeep, starts driving away, dinosaur starts chasing. He gets stuck in his Jeep. So what does he do when he's getting chased? He runs out to the front, grabs his winch cable, runs around a tree, connects it to itself. Now in a situation like that, what would happen as he pulls on that winch cable? Yeah, it would cut the tree, choke the tree, could break the tree, pull it down. Yeah, it could do a bunch of different things. And that's not treading lightly. So he deserved to get eaten for that one. What he should have had instead is this little tree saver. So this tree saver is a lot wider and thicker than a synthetic rope or cable winch line. So it's going to evenly distribute the load on the tree much healthier and much better. So now we have to start off by looking at trees around us. What tree could I pull on out here? There's a lot of skinny ones. What if I go to a tree like this? Can I trust something like this? With the weight of my vehicle? No, right? All right, so I go on an adventure. I start looking around. I start looking for some trees. I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching, and boom, I found it. All right, come here, tree. There's your tree. <laughs> so this is my big, strong, alive tree right here. Now I go to this tree, I grab this, and I wrap it around the tree. Now typically, you would want to go all the way to the bottom, to the base of that tree. I don't need to know him that well. So for this case, we're going to stay up here. Now what you do after you wrap it around the tree, you nest these two loops together, and you go to your winch line. Now it's either going to be a closed system or an open system. A closed system is like this. There's no openings whatsoever, kind of as you'd expect. Or if there's an open system, it's either going to be a hook, or it's going to be kind of like a carabiner right here, where you can just open it momentarily. Clip it across, boom, now you're connected, and that's what you want to pull on instead. Now as I'm pulling on this tree, if I see that it starts to move slightly, I probably should release all that pressure and go to a different tree, because it's not going to be strong enough to hold my weight. Thank you, tree. You did a great job. So when it comes to trees, you just have to be aware that you don't want to kill the tree. Going back to that tread lightly, 
and especially out here in the west, we have Bureau of Land Management. And what they can do is if they go on a trail and notice that a very technical section of trail has a lot of dead trees around it, I'm pretty sure they could figure out why. People are getting stuck or they're struggling, so they're hooking onto the trees. But when they hook onto the trees, they're also damaging and killing them. So, Bureau of Land Management, all they have to do is toss a fence around it. We're no longer allowed to play on that land. So this will keep trails open for much longer and it's much better towards these trees. So yeah, going back to tread lightly. Tree straps, very helpful. Now this is multi-purpose. You could also use this as a tow strap. So if the vehicle breaks down on the side of the road, connect it, pull it down the road nice and easy. I need, I need you. Me? Yes. And I need you. Perfect. Come on. Look. All right. I'm going to have you guys come down here for me. So I have a challenge. So right here in front, we have two openings. So I'm going to have you connect this and this strap to one of those two openings, whichever one you feel is right. I'm going to have you connect the soft shackle and this strap to the one on this side. Okay. What I think is right. Yeah, whatever you feel is right. I trust your judgment. So here you go as well. All right, you guys got this. Terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, you got 30 seconds. Go. So what they're connecting to right now, if you see a loop like that or a loop back here on any other type of vehicle, it's a tow point. So if the vehicle were to break down, that's how you ratchet strap it down to a flatbed truck. Now on Broncos, they are rated recovery points and time. All right, so both of them. That's really embarrassing. You both did it. Both? I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. You actually both did it perfectly, so thank you guys. Um, let's see. I don't know if I have any. All right. Oh, I do have two stickers left. Ah, there you go. Boom. Alright, the next person is going to get a carabiner because that's all I have left. So, these are rated recovery points on the front of these vehicles and on the back as well. Depending on the trim, you might have two recovery points, you might only have one on one side. But that is rated for one and a half times your vehicle weight. So you can do a full force recovery on these components and not have to worry about them flying off. So the little stretch one, is that rated for that same weight? So it's actually weighted for much more weight than that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but great question. So you decided to put this in the smaller hole. Why'd you do that? So it can't wiggle around. Exactly, yeah, it doesn't have a lot of movement. And that's exactly why Ford put that there. It is the perfect size for the screw pin of the hard shackle. So that's perfect, great job. It's a closed system, I can pull, I don't have to worry about it flying off. All right, so you put it through the bigger opening. That's exactly what we'd want to do. That's why they gave you that bigger opening so you could fit the soft shackle through. Now there's this little black rubber piece on the soft shackle and it's there for multiple reasons. The first reason is it's there to tell you the company that built it and it's weight rating. Now how much weight do you think that soft shackle, that rope can handle? Throw out some numbers. 15,000. Not a bad guess. So it would tell you on it, it says a minimum breaking strength of 25,110 pounds. So that rope itself can handle up to 25,000 pounds comfortably and you know it won't break until that point. So with knowing that on the soft shackle, well now how much weight do you think the hard shackle can handle? More? Yeah, it can handle, it says working load limit of four and three quarter tons. Now technically that's 9,000 pounds. But in the rigging industry and off-road industry, there's a safety factor of three. Surprisingly, off-road recovery has a lot of numbers involved and you do have to do a lot of math. We're not here to do that, so we're not going to. But we're just going to triple that working load limit. So now we're going from 9,000 with a safety factor of three, we're at 27,000 now. So 27,000 pounds comfortably that we can work with this hard shackle. So both well over the weight of your vehicle. Now if we go to the back of this other Bronco in front of us, those recovery points are at a different angle, but it's still the same concept. So if we go back here, this one has two, because this is a Badlands Bronco. So <laughs> how this works, we have a saying in the off-road industry, it is screw down so you don't screw up. And what I'm trying to say there is you want to screw going down towards the ground, because when you do a recovery and you're doing all those pulls, the vibration can loosen the pin. And if it loosens it, it's not going to fall out of place. It's just going to rattle. Where if you had it upside down and it were to loosen, it's going to fly out. And now it's going to break off. It's probably going to go flying somewhere. So you always want to screw down towards the ground. And then the soft shackle is the same method. You want to have the knot 
up towards the sky. So you'd loosen it, wrap the strap around. Make sure it's on this little black rubber piece so you're damaging that piece instead of the rope. It's gonna give you more of a lifespan and then just give it a nice little tug. As you pull more and more, it's gonna tighten that loop around the knot as opposed to if you went upside down. As you pull more and more, now you have the possibility of the loop falling off the knot every time you create the slack. So just having that go towards the sky. Uh, it's a pretty easy process. Recovery is, can be very simple if you let it be. If a vehicle's not on top of somebody or on fire, it's really not a very stressful situation. So don't try to rush anything. Because when you try to rush a recovery, that's when the damage and pain really starts. So how it works is it's gonna stretch 30% of its original length. Once it gets to that max point of stretch, it's gonna use that shock load and that rebound to snatch the vehicle up from the ground. So is that exactly how you'd expect that rubber band to work? You're gonna have two vehicles connected, one that is stuck deep into the ground, the other that is going to start pulling it out. Like a toe strap, you're slowly gonna build that tension and move down the road. Or a recovery strap, from a dead stop, you're gonna start picking up that speed. Now I'm not saying book it, slam it on the gas, see how fast you can go for that short time period, but you do wanna have enough momentum to create that stretch, because that is what's creating that shock load to get the vehicles unstuck. We also call it a snatch strap, because you are snatching the vehicle from the ground. So I like to start with a five miles an hour and then slowly build my way up every, add two miles an hour every time. Because if I start at 35 miles an hour and put all the force into that, I can easily tear my recovery strap. As opposed to if I start at five miles an hour, it doesn't work, get to seven, doesn't work, try nine, nothing. All right, try 11, 11 works like a charm, awesome, sweet. So now I know that 11 miles an hour got me unstuck, I'm safe and I am ready. Does that make sense that way? Perfect. So just start small, build your way up, uh, recovery strap, this one is 30 foot, thir uh, 30 feet long. It's going to stretch 30% of its original length. There's a lot of really nice straps nowadays that, yes, it's orange, or you're going to see this bright, bright neon green. But once it gets old, there's going to be a red lacing inside. And there's a saying called, if you see red, you're dead, which means that this is going to break within the next use or so. So if you ever see that and it gets worn down, uh, it is definitely time to replace it. Or if you see it start to fray, like this soft shackle is starting to fray already. This only has a certain number of bolts left in its soft shackle. So there are a few things that when doing a recovery, I hope you never do or you never have to see. Uh, who here has kids? Raise your hand and keep it up. All right, now out of those of you that have kids, who doesn't want to have anymore? Why don't you stand right in this job? Yeah, that's a good time to stop. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That was a family. Uh -huh. <laughs> Alright, so this vehicle is stuck. It is stuck and I need to pull it up. And I am going to be the Bronco that pulls it up. Now, this gentleman right here, he's hanging out. Let's say he had to go use the tree facility, so he had to step away from a moment. And now he's starting to come back. And he wants to watch the recovery. Uh, up here with the peanut gallery. So what he's gonna do is all of a sudden he's quickly gonna try to walk over the strap. Oh now I'm gonna stop you when you straddle the strap. Go ahead. All right, hold right a little bit more and hold right there. So let's say as the lead takeoff driver, I do not know that somebody's stepping over my connected line. So I just start taking off. I'm going, I'm having a grand old time and I'm having a lot of speed. That's gonna go up. That's not gonna be a pretty picture. All right, thank you. So the reason I do that example is one, it's really funny, and two, you're definitely gonna remember that. Male or female, don't matter, you're gonna remember. You won't do it uh, twice. Yeah. So never walk over or on top of straps that are connected to any vehicles whatsoever. I also say don't walk on top of it, because if all that force got launched up, I'm not gonna be able to weigh it down, and I'm more than likely not gonna land on my feet. So if you need to go around a recovery, go around the recovery completely. So go around all connected vehicles. Whether it's 27 connected vehicles, don't matter. Walk around the entire thing. Um, there are also situations where there's a triangle. So let's say I had to redirect. I connected a strap to that, then to that, and then I ran another one over here. So I had a nice little triangle. So this little triangle that I'm in, we call that the triangle of death. Because if something were to go wrong, I am without a doubt going to be taken out by something. Yeah. Uh, so making sure that you are away from the recovery. You're not in the middle of anything. If this is a 30 foot strap, I should be three times the length of any strap that I'm using. 
So I need to be 90 feet away. But I don't want to be 90 feet away in the direction of where everything can travel. Because if I have a hard shackle and it breaks, it can travel 90 feet. That's for sure. So I need to be 90 feet in a cross path. So I'm for sure not going to get hit by anything if it were to break. Does that make sense with everyone? So just being three times the length of any type of connected point, winch line, straps, ropes, anything, but in a cross pattern instead of just a straight line. Um, one more thing I'd like to add, and if you remember anything, I want it to be this. Can I do a recovery if I have, I have an F-150, that's what I offer in personal, and I don't have any recovery points like the Broncos, but I do have a hitch receiver and a tow hitch and a tow ball. So if I need to do a recovery, should I go to the tow ball and toss this over and do, and do a recovery? I don't think so. No. no. You don't think so? No. no. Everyone's saying no. Why, why can't I do a recovery? It'll slip off. Just slide off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every time I create that tension and then I give that slack, I can easily just pop off. But tow balls and tow hitches are rated for downward static drop movement. So it's rated for you to drop a trailer on top of it and then move together. It's not rated for all of that energy that you are trying to put through it. So it can easily shear off and become a cannonball. That has happened before. Oh. There have been worse situations where not just the tow ball itself, but the entire tow hitch broke off out of the receiver and flew towards people. That has also taken a lot of lives in the off-road industry because tow hitches and tow balls are not rated for a recovery. They're not rated for that shock load. So you can easily tear them out. Now there is a way, if you have a hitch receiver, to do a tow or a pull. What you need to do is you get the hitch receiver, it should be empty at that point, you need a hitch pin and your strap. So you take your hitch receiver, you put the loop into that hitch receiver, you put the hitch pin across, and now you have a closed system to where nothing is going to fall off or out. And you could do a pull on them. That's how I do recoveries in my vehicle, if that's how I pull people out, because that is the only way I could do that, unless I want to wrap it around my fringe or something like that. So. Hitch receiver, pin across, bada bing, bada boom. But most of you have Broncos, I really doubt you're going to have hitch receivers anyways. But it's just a good thing to remember. Oh no! Oh no! I know we all heard that honk. You must be wondering what that was from. That was from Bronco One recklessly driving with one hand. He said shuffle steering. That is that garbage. Can you let me out real quick? Yeah. Sorry, it takes me a second to stop. Give me a second to get in front of you. So I have done this since the opening of this location, and every single group that has ever gone out, I've been a part of. I have only had, in the last two and a half years, three groups that have not Bronco Bump. Isn't that insane? walking What can I say? He knows all my good angles. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about go modes or use go modes. And that's what we're going to do now. So I want everyone to put on the brake shift into neutral. Now, if you are in a Badlands or Wild Track Bronco, I need you to grab the outer ring of that go boat down and rotate it safety Baja mode. Now, for those of you that are in the Outer Banks or Black Diamond model, you are looking for sand mode. Now, in your own personal vehicles, if you do not have Baja mode, your replacement will be sand mode. Every off-road terrain management go mode has a replacement. So later on, we'll use rock crawl, but if you don't have rock crawl, you use mud and rust. Same thing for Baja, if you don't have Baja, you have sand. So what does this go mode do for you? Well, it's a safe preset. So they went to professionals like Von Ginn Jr. and Lauren Healy and said, hey, when you drive fast style off-road driving, so Baja style, how would you set up your vehicle? Well, they said, before high, turn off all traction control. Boom, that's exactly what your Bronco did. Now on the top of your left of your screen, you're gonna notice instead of a blue background with a Bronco icon, you're gonna see a cactus next to a flag for Baja mode, or just a cactus for sand mode. Now what does sand mode do for you? Well, it put you in four high and it turned on your rear locker. That is mainly for beach style driving. The reason you have your rear locker on is it wants you to maintain that traction, maintain that wheel spin and power to keep you going on the beach instead of just getting stranded and stuck. So go ahead and turn off that rear locker if you went into sand mode. But the most important part of all this is that we're all in four high, so shift back into drive. Now the biggest part about goat modes and what they do, because it's not just saved presets, that is nothing special. We can all put ourselves in the four high and disconnect or take off all traction control. We can also put ourselves in the four high and turn on a rear locker. So that's not special. The special thing about goat mode is it changes your shift points and your throttle response. So Baja mode is off-road sport mode. So you're going to notice when you get on the throttle, it's a lot more touchy. So what it does is, like sport mode, it pre-spools that turbo. So the second you get on the throttle, it's immediate torque. That's cool. Now, when it comes to gearing, in Baja mode, it is going to rev really high up. In each gear, it's going to sound like you're redlining, and then it's going to switch you out last second. Why it does that is it's trying to get the top speed out of every gear before it switches you to the next one for Baja style driving. Now, for sand mode, that pedal is a little dull, but you're going to feel that gear stay a little bit longer. It's going to extend that gear. So feel it out, and then a little bit later after a restroom break for our next trail, we'll use rock crawl and mud and run. But I can use sport mode or eco mode or slippery because why the heck would we need any of that out here? <laughs> I can feel it. So before we get going, uh, just kind of enjoying this scenery. We do have a beautiful overlook that we're going to walk to in just a second. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty cool little Kodak moment. Making the nice weather. This probably is the last thing you thought you would see when you heard off-roading in Nevada. Uh, which is good. A lot of people think we're just going to drive up and down the strip all day. Alright, follow me. Make sure you have your phones, any type of fancy cameras, your GoPro. So if you look down there to the right, you're going to see that building with the white roof. That is where you ate lunch when we did introductions this morning. That is our whole base camp area. That is at about 5,700 feet in elevation. We are currently at 6,000. That is our whole base camp area off to the right. If you go over to the left, you're going to see those cabins. That is not part of our property. That's our neighbors, the Methodist Church Camp. So if we would have kept driving up that dirt road for another five seconds, it would have been on the right-hand side. That's our front gate for on going on that road, you get to three different homes. There are residents that live there, and then 
and Spider Rip into a network of about 150 different types of trails. Some a little bit more technical, some fast stuff, some drifting, <coughs> any type of off-roading you can think of. It goes around this entire mountain, taking you to Good Springs, Nevada. Some of those trails will take you to Northern Las Vegas, others will take you to Northern California. You could drive for thousands of miles and not touch pavement if you don't want to on those trails. And that's the best part about public land. You just keep driving. And once you run into a gate, that's where you gotta cut it. If you look up and to the right, you're gonna see a little bit of red rock. If you go over to the right on the other side of the mountain, that is where you would find the city of Las Vegas. I call this the best view in Vegas because you don't see where you lost all your money last night. Some people like that joke, the people that don't are the ones that lost quite a bit, and that's okay. If you look over to your left side, those mounds with a little bit of snow on it, that is Mount Charleston Lee Canyon area. That is where our ski resort is. So if you're on the strip, you have to drive about an hour and 15 minutes north to get to the ski resort, which is really cool. They have a total of three lifts and about 22 runs if they have a lot of heavy snow. Behind us on the left side, that is Mount Hodesy. That's pretty much it for this area. By where you park your Broncos, there was an old lapel station for the Boy Scouts. They had a rappel station. Off to the side, they had a little rock wall. All right, thank you so much for coming along on this journey with us. We hope you enjoyed it just as much as we did. It was honestly such a blast. If you have the opportunity to come out and come do this, you definitely should. Diego was our guide for the day and he was phenomenal, funny, educational, informational, all the above. And honestly, you can't beat off-roading in Vegas, come on. 
tons to do. So we highly recommend it. Uh, we were told today they will be doing this for just a couple more years and this was actually supposed to be the last year. So if you are ordering a Bronco, you have a Bronco, don't wait. You're definitely going to want to hit up at least one of these locations, if not this one. Book it, guys. Trust me, you're not going to regret it. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye, guys.